2020 to order. Prayer, myself. Everyone, please rise. I should bow your head. I have a prayer of happiness. God, help us awake each, each morning with hope for everyone. Guide us so that we can discover life in all of its infinite varieties. Help us discover the joy in each day and all the beauty of your creations. Help us find greater happiness. Help us all be thankful for, ev for every person in our lives. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Here. Councillor Mangini? Here. Councillor Muller? Here. Councillor Riley? Here. Councillor Sferraza? Here. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Here. Councillor Bosco? Here. Councillor Sakala? Here. Councillor Hemler? Here. Councillor Kiner? There are 10 present, one absent. Moving on to item four, fire evac evacuation announcement. In case of fire, please orderly exit the building in the back to our left or right, out the back door or to, to the doors to our left, your right, out the first doors in the hall, down the stairway, and out orderly into the parking lot in case of a fire. Moving on to item five, minutes of the preceding meeting. Special meeting, January 21st, 2020. Do I have a motion to approve? By Councillor Muller? Second. By D Councillor Mangini. Is there any additions, deletions, changes, omissions? I'm also Hearing none, by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed abstentions? 10 in favor, zero against? No abstentions? Moving on to the regular meeting of January 21st, 2020. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. Councilor Muller, second by Councilor Mangini. Is there any additions, deletions, omissions, corrections? Hearing none, by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed abstentions? 10 in favor and zero against? Moving on to the special meeting of January 25th, 2020. Do I have a motion to approve it by Councilor Mangini? Second. Seconded by Councilor Muller. Is there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Nine in favor and one abstention. All right, moving on to item six. Special guests, we are very pleased to have Pam Townsend here today from the Reese Across America. Welcome. Welcome, Pam. Thank you. Uh, I think I have turned it off. Is it on right? Yeah, right? Yeah, there, there it go. goes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Pam Townsend, and I am here to express my appreciation to Enfield for their amazing support to Reeds Across America. For the past 11 years, Enfield has had a Reeds Across America ceremony. Over the years, different organizations have sponsored the ceremony, but for the past two years, the American Legion John Macholik Unit 154 Auxiliary, and there are members here in the audience, and my camera person here, <laughs> um, has been the sponsor. Um, the Auxiliary Unit 154 is located in Thompsonville, by the way. I am not only the president of the auxiliary, but I have been extremely fortunate to be Enfield's Reese Across America location coordinator during the past two years. I have also been very fortunate to work with Lori Gates, and we all know how Lori Gates is in taking care of our veterans in town. Um, Lori Gates and I are a, par a partner in support of Reese Across America's mission to remember our fallen, honor those who serve, and teach our children the value of freedom. Lori and I work independently and as a team for the success of this mission. I like to say we are um, on the same highway, just in different lanes. Lori coordinates the convoy, the school events, and I coordinate with the assistance of Unit 154 um, Auxiliary the ceremony at St. Pat's Cemetery, wreath sponsorship and wreath placement within the ceremony, within the cemetery. Now having said all of that, doesn't make any difference how well organized you are or how good you are at coordinating. 
an event does not happen without the, without the support of everyone. Um, it just wouldn't, wouldn't be successful. And because of you, Enfield, I feel pretty comfortable saying we were successful. The theme for the 2019 theme for Reese Across America was everyone plays a part. And that is just what Enfield and the surrounding communities did. You each played a part in the success of Enfield's Reese Across America mission. Whether I reached out to someone or they contacted me, people wanted to play a part to remember and honor our veterans. On that cold and dreary day, you came out. No matter what our differences are, you remembered, you honored 1,058 veterans by sponsoring and placing wreaths at their final resting place, and you taught the next generation the value of freedom. For that, I personally thank everyone here and our community. <clears throat> to the town council, town employees, and ETV was awesome. The guys at DPW, they, they couldn't help me enough. I mean, every time I reached out to them, they were there. Um, people in the town hall, just, I never once got a pushback, and it was just very overwhelming. Um, the first responders, the schools, the coaches, the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, small businesses, private organizations, veteran organizations, the Blue Star and the Gold Star families, and of course, the people of Enfield. And I went through this list in my head several times, and I hope I did not forget anyone, because I personally thank you again. I am retired Army, served almost 27 years. My husband is a combat, combat veteran and served 37 years. It is truly an honor to call Enfield our home and to know that the town that we chose to reside in cares so much about their veterans. We moved here about 29 years ago, if I got that right. He'll tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and I came from New York, got stationed here in Norwich. That's where I met Lucian. And uh, we ended up here in Enfield. We decided to come to Enfield to, uh, to live. So it is important to us and the many veterans residing in Enfield. So again, thank you. Um, and although the convoy did not stop in Enfield, I do have some comments from Lori Gates, and this is in Lori's voice. While we had everything in place for a return visit of Wreaths Across America trucks as they headed from Maine to Arlington in December, the one thing we couldn't control was Mother Nature. Since she didn't want to cooperate, the very difficult but safest and best decision was made to cancel the visit to town, allowing our Walmart friends extra ta travel time to get their precious car cargo to hallowed ground on time. I, meaning Lori, received many messages throughout the remainder of their trip, and since they were truly disappointed to have to miss Enfield, they hope that they get that they consider us for a visit in 2020. And hopefully this time Mother Nature will get the memo. I want to sincerely express my gratitude to all the working parts behind the convoy, as most of the public doesn't realize all the planning and coordination involved behind the scenes from police, fire, EMS, town, American Legion Post, schools, students, the general public, and et cetera. That, that go into putting Enfield on the Wreaths Across America map. Thank you to all of you. Let's keep our fingers crossed for a return trip and work together to, to continue to be a desired destination for Wreaths Across America. Those are the ends of, end of Lori's comments. The 2020 theme is Be an American Worth Fighting For was inspired from a keynote speaker during a stop of the wreath escort to Arlington National Cemetery. I think the people of Enfield are worth fighting for. You show it every day and especially this past December. I know your passion and support will continue for this year. I have already begun working on wreath sponsorship and preparation for this year's ceremony. Again, we need about 1,700 wreaths and I expect that number to go up by the end of the year, unfortunately. 
to remember and honor every veteran that is laid to rest at St. Pat's Cemetery. The ceremony will take place on December 19th. Read sponsorship has already begun online. I have not created the forms yet to get out to the public. Um, you can go online any time of the year, all year long. To make it easier for you to sponsor, contact me at EnfieldWAA at Yahoo.com, and I will email you a direct link for wreath sponsorship for St. Patrick's Cemetery. Along with that site, there are local fundraising groups listed if you would like to support one of them. I offer this because the main website can be a bit challenging spent many hours on the phone with people trying to utilize the direct's uh, website. So again, I thank everyone for your tremendous support. Um, it, it was truly overwhelming to be standing doing the, uh, the, the speech at the ceremony and um, seeing everyone. I mean, it just was overwhelming. We, I think we had the largest crowd that we've had in uh, in 11 years, so I appreciate that. Thank you, um, and I am all done. If anybody has any questions or comments, thank you, thank you. Thank any you. questions or comments from it? Councilor Bosco? How many reads are short? <laughs> you know what? You, you got to keep pushing. How many reads are short? And you need to come maybe in the the summer and push. How many reads are short? You know, because I'm sure that. You know, when they hear your 1,700 grease short, I mean, it may help. Right. Uh, well, right now, um, I am about 1,200 wreaths short. <laughs> um, and, uh, and part of that was the night before the ceremony, Wreaths Across America did a, um, a quick program, a two-for-one, uh, kind of caught us all off guard, but I was able to get the, the um, sponsors that do the larger numbers to uh, go ahead and order for me and helped us double our wreath sponsorship at that, right after Christmas. So that's about it. Any, anybody else? Deputy Mayor Suzak. So we have 1,700 veterans at the St. Patrick Cemetery. Do we have more veterans throughout the town at other cemeteries? And do you have like, a number, I, you know, because once it starts and you get success there, it's going to. Right. Because I know I've had people, you know, in the Hazardville section say, you know, I think there's veterans in the Hazardville Cemetery as well. There, there are uh, veterans buried in every cemetery throughout um, Enfield. And give me a chance, and I may have that number for you. He's looking it up. Lucian, you, <laughs> Lucian, you adding those up for me? Thank you. You get, you get 10 seconds. Uh, yeah. That's Mr. Young. He's good with numbers. The, well, the, the, the Veteran Council puts the flags, get, gets the flags for uh, Memorial Day and Veterans Day. So that helps us with a count of how many veterans we we have. Roughly 5,500. There you go. So there's 5,500 throughout the town. Um, and if if people would like to get a wreath themselves they can pick they can sponsor a wreath and pick it up the day of the cemetery, uh, the ceremony and bring it to another cemetery to put on their veterans wreath um, I, I don't have a problem with that but my ultimate goal is to cover st. Pat's first but I I get why people would want to take I think it's it. good that people know that they can do that and yes. you know because it is, it's a great ceremony. Thank, Thank you. you for all your hard work. Thank you. And also, you you made a, did a great job recognizing everyone. But remember, you folks actually allowed yourself. Sometimes when people volunteer, sometimes it's it's always nice, of course, but sometimes <laughs> it's more work than it's worth. But I think again, I want to thank you and Lori for allowing the hockey team to help you. They got a lot out of it. Thanks. It was great for those kids. And by the way, their 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 season's going pretty good, by the way, too. So maybe there's cor correlation between that. Yeah, yeah. And it was great that you allowed them to partake in the uh, you know that day, and I know they got a lot out of it. The the uh, the Enfield hockey team, they were super flexible. There was a lot of changes that happened the the couple of days going up to the ceremony, and you know it was like okay, I I need this many over here. No, no, I need to put them over here because the wreath count I 
at the last minute I got um, quite a few wreaths from the state cemetery that were delivered the day before. So, And, and I know they're called the Eagles because we have someone from East, a couple from East Grammy, and I think Suffield on the team. I know it's a tri-town, so I want to make sure I'm yeah. fair. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. I wasn't sure exactly yeah, who all, who all Eagle, was right. there. I was dealing with the, the parents, and so, but they were super flexible with me, and they did an outstanding job in, in uh, watching everything. Thank you for allowing everything. them to volunteer. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Councillor Mangini. I just want to say thank you again for all your hard work. I know welcome. what you thank went you. through, and <laughs> it was wonderful to thank pay you. tribute like that. Thank you. Well, it sounds Appreciate like you got a goal of 5,500, right? Or, or more. I have, a, I have a lot of other veterans, right. not just St. Pat's. So then I'd we'll, love to we'll tentatively schedule for early after the budget. You can come back, and we'll see where you're at. OK. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. You as well. Moving on to item seven, public communications. It is 720. We ask that people please refrain from personalities. You have to be an Enfield resident. And would anyone please li like to speak for the public uh, the public this time? Mr. Young. Good evening. George Young, 8 Holly Lane, Enfield, Connecticut. I've uh, handed out a chart for you to look at while I'm talking so that you'll have an idea where some of these numbers might come from. While you're looking at the chart in front of you, I would like to comment on last month's PAR report. It was filled with lots of goodies, but I am just going to talk about the Council's approval of the resolution to settle pending property tax appeals for the Enfield Square and the State Line Plaza for the assessment year 2016 to the present. Some things will just not go away. There were three resolutions passed that evening without a lot of fanfare or disagreement because all the legal issues were resolved prior to the meeting. It was mentioned that the proper steps were taken by the finance department and the council to make sure there was a very little or no impact on our budget. But there was no mention what was specifically done, and there was no copy that I saw of the stipulation for judgment, which was to be filed with the superior court. I have done a chart that the council has been given to show the effects of this resolution so you could follow these amounts that I will talk about and where they're derived from. It shows that the appeals reflect a decrease in real estate taxes to our town of $1,628,079 for the fiscal year 2018, 19, and 20. I believe that it is all being repaid to the taxpayers in fiscal year 20 by either refunds back or reductions in the January 2020 payments to the town. I would welcome comments from either the council or the town manager on any of this. I cannot tell you if any interest has to be prepaid on the prior overpayments or what legal fees we incurred or if we have to pay any legal fees or damages to the parties that brought the appeals. How can we be so far wrong? to value property 100% above their fair market value and expect them to accept this valuation. Folks at home, for example, we are talking the revaluation of eight of the nine parcels of the Enfield Square in 2018 at $42,842,950 and having it revised downward to $21,500,000, which represents $612,000 $612,841 in taxes that are not going to be collected for 2020. According to my calculations, the $1,628,079 of total taxes overcharged for those years for the two locations involved are split between the town and fire district number two, since this is the fire district that the properties are located in, I believe. They are $1,368,980 for the town taxes and $259,059 for the fire district taxes, respectively. Since the fire department was already paid their monies as budgeted back in August, will they be charged back or will the general fund pick up this whole amount? There's probably enough money for a fire district to buy a new ladder truck. The two prior assessments completed for 2011 and 2016 were both done by Vision Government Solutions. Did they gather recent sales data and compare these sales to other properties? Do they have any liability in this matter? If this was a valuation for the IRS, there would be substantial penalties involved. 
We are now scheduled for another reevaluation in 2021, according to the last PAR report, for which the RFPs were issued and scheduled to be open over the next couple weeks. I feel there should be a substantial savings to revalue the above area since it is mostly been resolved and it appears that state line plaza has been fixed for the next two years in 2001 when booklets were sent to homeowners during the revaluation it was stated in the booklet that was prepared by the enfield committee for reevaluation that the town assessor will supervise the revaluation process and will be responsible for the final determination of value it was also the responsibility of the firm, which was at that time Coal Layered Trumbull Company, CLT, a state certified revaluation company to be responsible to research and determine fair market value in a particular area. I somehow feel that we have all been let down this time. We would be screaming if the state took $1.6 million away from us, but without the dollarizing of the last meeting, those resolutions were just words. 30 seconds. I know how frustrated many council members get when they have to go to referendum to spend more than .0002 times the town's assessed valuation, but here you were able to approve reduction by just a vote of hands of $1.6 million. Isn't it ironic you have, spending, you have a spending cap limitation but can approve an income reduction for a far greater amount? I have no idea how the town administratively handled the loss of revenue, but it should be made public. At the last town meeting, I suggested one overall mill rate for all five fire departments in town. That's a long way off, I feel, but I bet the fire district number two will not be absorbing this loss by itself. This sounds like more teeth for a consolidation effort. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be back. And I'd like to speak for the council at this time. Bob. Mic on? Name and address, sir. Well, I always want to say one thing. I watch, I watch the town council at home. Some of you don't turn your mic on. It's silent. Many times there's probably five to ten minutes of silence. Name and address, Bob. I will. Yeah. I will. Let me vent first. But say it first, then vent all you want. I live in Enfield, okay? Listen. You have a problem with the sound system in, in the TV. Bob, you still haven't said your name and address, sir. Come on. My name is Bob T. Katz, Enfield, Connecticut, okay? The sound system has to be fixed. You stay home and watch it. You get 10 minutes of silence. You get buzzing. Some of you don't turn on your mics. We ought to change the mic system so when you talk, you can pick up. There's little meetings going on when people are at home. What are you guys talking about? You're whispering to each other. Bob T. Katz, 18, 815 Woodgate Circle. Thank you. All right. Now, I asked the chief of police why the town of Wallingford can run their department on 75 sworn police officers. And we have to have 95. And our crime rate is higher. Our crime rate should be lower. I asked about a council member and I asked the police chief about a crime map. I have to check with the FBI. Well, I found the crime map. And the crime map divides different sections of the town. This is the crime map. How come nobody knows about a crime map? What they do is, in the crime map, they give you the safest areas. They don't tell you the high crime areas. So with, with 13 districts, you can figure out what the high, high crime area is. Broadbrook, Abbey Road, safest place. Skidico, second. North Thompsonville, third. Kings Corner, fourth. Southwood Acres, fifth. Sh Sherwood Manor, sixth. Woodgate Circle, seventh. Shaker Road, eighth. Ninth is Hazardville, and 10 is Washington Road. So what's left? That's where all the patrol should be. The other districts where there's a high crime rate. I think it's about time we had a civilian review board for the police department because we're not, we're not getting the answers. I asked answers for two years in a row and I still don't have an answer. So I've done my research. And also, <clears throat> I did some research into the Shelton police, police department. 
Shelton is probably about the same population of Enfield. Don't forget, Enfield has a prison and it has a college. Department of is entrusted with the responsibility of enforcing all state and local laws within the sh within Shelton. The 52 sworn police officers and 21 civilian members of the Shelton Police Department are dedicated to the mission of the department to enhance the quality of life. There are more than 70,000 people that live and work in, in the Shelton community during the day. We don't have that high. In 2018, they responded to 45,000. Now, I had a meeting with the Wallingford, one of the Wallingford supervisors, and I says, I was told that Wallingford's a different town. He says, are you kidding me? We have Meriden to the north, which has a high crime rate. We have Hamden to the south. You're surrounded by communities. The, high cr the crime rate is low. So why are they singling out Wallingford? Enfield sh should look at, look at themselves and see what's going on. And he explained to me, he says, our crime went up since they put a substation in the Walmart in New Haven. They're losing over a million dollars a year in shoplifting. He says, as soon as they put the substation there, you know what happened? All the criminals from New Haven come up to Wallingford. Our hands are full. So I asked East Windsor, what's going on? He says, are you kidding me? We're losing a million dollars a year. They just fired the store manager because he couldn't get the job done. So why don't we fix crime around our neighborhood? We're surrounded by Longmeadow, Summers, Suffield, Windsor Locks, East Windsor, which has a low crime rate. Why can't we get our act together and do it right? So maybe we ought to have civilians running the police department. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else like to speak for the council? I have something that's very related to what this man said. What's your name? Bob. Bob, I'm glad you came first, because I'm going to come second. Name and address. My for name her. is Tina Justra Perez, and I live on 57 Navi Road. Donna's my woman, <laughs> my councilman. Yeah, yeah, five five minutes or so. You okay. know, I, I, I don't try to. Okay. Be, yeah. Okay. Right ahead, your time. I'll right. try to be as brief as possible. Go right ahead. I'm very disappointed in Enfield. I'm very disappointed that people get murdered, kids get murdered, right on the side where I live. A guy, a, a teenager, got murdered. When I came in 2004. Someone was held hostage in her house. And he's right. All the nice areas, the police aren't there. And then when my alarm goes off and I'm in New Jersey, I have to pay $100 if nobody's there. Why did you guys pass these rules? Why is it pay for play like Hillary Clinton? And why is my house pressed? Why are my taxes price gouged? My house is only worth 200000 And I pay a, a two hundred thousand dollars and I pay eight one hundred dollars in taxes on Long Hollow Row Long Hollow Road there is a house that is for sale they had to drop it twenty five thousand dollars because nobody wants to buy it and it's ten thousand dollars for his taxes his house is way better than mine Okay, way better than mine, and no one wants to buy it. Anytime anybody leaves Bob De Janeiro's houses, they always leave at a loss. Because Enfield's is, their houses are not valued. No one wants to pay $500,000 for a house. So people get a good deal on a house. Someday, if I want to go back to Jersey, I'm going to take a loss on my house. And if my alarm goes off, why do I have to pay $100 if no one's there? People are being murdered. There's a high crime rate in, in a middle class neighborhood. And it's not fair. And then my neighbor Lorena, her mother's a senior citizen. She yielded at a stop sign and she got a ticket. And we're the people that have to shovel the snow on the corner of Bush and, and Abbey Road. And that belongs to you guys. And you picked a shitty builder to build those 23 houses because he picked Panella Plumbing, and Panella Plumbing gave him the lowest bid. When you do those houses at the train station, get a good builder, because Panella Plumbing, the first year, I had a gas leak. 
and I had to pay. Yeah, they, they did you, just you enough. You can't use the name of the company, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. The people that they used tried to make me a forever customer, but I went and I got a different company. And I'm going to have to sue the builder. Ben, I have all the proof. 16 years worth, because every year something comes up. So I'm asking you, when you build those houses in Thompsonville, near the train station, don't pick a banker to be your builder. Pick a real builder. Because all the businesses come here, and they exploit Enfield. That's all they do. And you need to change the rules. We shouldn't be getting tickets. Senior citizens shouldn't be getting a ticket when they yield at a stop sign. I should be able to call the police when I'm two and a half hours away for them to come to my house. Sometimes it's the wind and the alarm goes off. But my alarm has not gone off a lot. My alarm maybe goes off once every three or four years. And when I'm packing, people are watching me pack my car so they know I'm not sleeping in my house that night. So they'll come when it's dark, they'll come when it's Christmas, and they'll break into my house. So why did I spend thousands of dollars for an alarm system? Because when there was a, a gas leak in my house, it wasn't really a gas leak. I was cleaning, and I set off because I have a gas detector, carbon monoxide, everything. It's connected to the fire department. The fire department came, the whole world came to my house, didn't get charged anything. And it was a false alarm because I, I was cleaning and I sprayed something into the gas thing. But this man is right. We need police. All the crime is happening and we're the middle class people. We're paying the taxes and we're all the cops in Thompsonville. And you know what? You know that I'm friends with a lot of people in Thompsonville, but Thompsonville is safe. I'm there at all hours of the night and it's safe. 30, 30 seconds. Okay, so you need to consider the pay for play that's going with the police department. And also consider that a lot of the police officers are very rude. Not all of them, only the 1%. Because when they pull people over, they're rude and they're nasty. And that's making people leave the town. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Lucian. Welcome. Lucian Lefebvre, 54 Kimberly Drive, also Commander, American Legion Post 154. Just here to give a friendly reminder that this coming Sunday, February 9th, 11 o'clock Mass, St. Pat's in town here, we're having our 70th annual Four Chaplains Mass. The veterans participate. It, it's a good service to remember the four chaplains that went down with the Dorchester in World War II in the North Atlantic. And there is a luncheon downstairs afterwards, and the public is invited down to the luncheon. So just friendly reminder, 11 o'clock Mass, Sunday, February 9th. Hopefully we'll see you there. Thank, Thank you, you. sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else like to speak for the council at this time? You know, it's for the first time, for the second time. Mr. Young. George Young, 8 Holly Lane, Enfield. Uh, I thought that tonight uh, that we might be presented with information on the circuit breaker and elderly for the senior and disabled residents. I know this is a state mandated program that the state has stopped funding, but I hope our town will pick up this 100% because many people in these two groups need the help that they have been given. More than half of our budget goes to the Department of Education in this town, and very few of the members of this group of nearly 600 people have anyone in the school system. If anyone should get a tax break, it is them. It is not an entitlement, but a deserved tax break from the town to those who have funded and continue to help fund the town. The town needs to get to our legislatures and have the state restore monies back for this mandated program. Incidentally, on page one of the special meeting of January 25th, it stated that the town's spending cap on a project was 0 .002 of the grand list without going to a referendum. I believe it should read, Point zero 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 two, without going to a referendum. Uh, 
As far as school roofs and taxes and town roofs, I should I would like to encourage the uh, council to go to referendum and bond for the twenty one million dollars as a separate item from the roofs ref from the roads referendum because they need to be done. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Bob. Bob T. Katz, Woodgate Circle. The lady's right. When these police work on these construction sites, they're very rude. They're on their cell phones, their smartphones. You make you make start making the wrong turn, and they start screaming and yelling at you instead of saying, "Wait, wait a minute." So I think they need a lesson in, in politeness to the public. They're the ones paying them, and I think they're very rude, and it should things should change. It's, and if anybody watched the school board meeting, last meeting, about the racism and the bullying in the schools has to stop. We're at, at the edge of this community of things going bad, and nobody is doing anything about it. Now, let me, let me say one thing. Where do we stand as far as uh, individual <clears throat> student cost in, in Enfield? We're very good, 14,300. <clears throat> We're 150, 152nd out of 169 towns. That's pretty good. But where do we stand in administrative cost? And George has been very vocal about overfunding the school system. We're 28th, 28th from the top. And where do we stand as overall school spending? We're 30th. That's, that's unbelievable co high cost. We're taking it away from the students and we're paying administrators. When they closed the high school, when they closed the junior highs, when they closed Nathan Hale, they didn't lay anybody off. All they did was make smaller class sizes. Now, what's the performance of Enfield? This is a Stanford study. The average test scores were very good. We're 0.56 grade ahead of the, the nation. That's excellent. But where are we going? We're going down. All the money we're paying for these administrators, learning rates. Enfield School District in Connecticut provides roughly average educational opportunities. While children are in school, students learn 18% less each grade than the U.S. average. That's unacceptable. For all the money we're paying these administrators, that's unacceptable. The last part of this Stanford study. 30 seconds, sorry. Trend in test scores. Enfield School District shows declining educational opportunity test scores, decreasing an average of point. 06 grades each year from 2009 to 2016. We're going down. We're giving the school district more money every year and we're on our way down the hill. And none of you, none of you want to make cut cost. All we're doing is spending more money. We want to do roofs. We, we, we were doing all these other things. We're not cut spending. We don't need 95 police officers in the police department when a town same size has 55. We ought to have a civilian review committee to look at this like we did with the school system. Out of $60 million, we saved $5 million. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Tina? Okay, now um, I want to disagree with him to a certain point. I think education. Name is, an address, oh, sorry. Name just, an address, okay, sorry. Tina sorry. Juster Perez, 57 Abbey Road. I, I disagree with the cost. The problem is you got to find the fat. The fat is not the people. The fat is who's working there that's not providing the kids with a good education. Because Donna was one of the few people that wanted to, to, do, to redo JFK. That's how I met Donna. I never knew Donna, I only knew Joe. And a lot of you guys were against it. But why were you against getting $65 million to do a new school? I don't understand. 
And you know what? When Enfield High was built, some people told me that that's the reason why they moved into Enfield. I had friends when I moved here for Ford Motor Company. I had a friend, Dominic. He's a senior citizen. He wanted to move to Enfield. He liked my house. He liked the area. But then his wife, who's smart, checked out the school system, and they moved to Granby. But they didn't need a school system. Their daughter was going to college. You know why? Because someday they're going to sell their house. And if you don't have a good school system, you can't sell your house. If you don't have a good police department, and they're not friendly, and they're not, um, you don't need to be friendly to be a cop. You just have to be neutral and not nasty. And when you have to pay and you live in a good area, you get upset and you leave and you move. And when you have to shovel snow for the town and your taxes go up and up, we have to shovel the snow. That's a kid's bus stop. And you know, me and my neighbor, Bob Turner, my, my husband, Carlos, and him, they work together. Whoever gets out first, they shovel the, they, they snow blow for each other. We work, you know, the people in the presidential section, or, well, the Bob, the Somerset Builders houses, we all know each other. No, no names, please. Okay. Sorry. No. We all know each other. We're all friends with each other. People on Long Hollow Road, they wave. They don't even know us. They wave and say hello. All the people are so nice in the presidential section. We shouldn't have these problems. And you can't sell a house if the police is charging people to come see them, if the police constantly give them tickets. And if your school system is poor, you can't either. You got to find out why they're doing bad. Don't take the money away, because it's only going to get worse. Because 30 seconds. Because we need the police. Uh, the police are important, and the teachers are important. Uh, but you know, you need to correct what's wrong. You need to review what's wrong. OK? I'm done. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Marie. Marie Pisner, 25 Roy Street. I'm a lifetime resident of Enfield. It's not on. Am I on now? Can you so, hear yeah. me? Is it on? Cindy? Is it on? Okay. It's yeah. red. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a lifetime resident of Enfield. Um, I'm a downtown girl, grew up on South River Street. My husband and I got married. We lived on Belmont Avenue, and now we've been up on Roy Street for the last 43 years. I know the area well, the entire town. Um, there's always going to be good parts, bad parts, where you want to live, where you don't want to live. That's why we have choices. As far as our school system goes, I think we have an awesome school system. I think the problem is we don't, we expect too much out of our teachers and our administrators and not enough out of our families. Education starts at home. Education needs to be reinforced at home. I am a strong believer in that. As far as our police department goes, I've never had a problem with one of them. And I've lived here my whole life, and I can proudly say I've never had a ticket. Maybe I just went a little too fast and got, they couldn't catch me, but I never got a ticket. I will say, though, last summer, someone leaving my house had an accident, and we had the best cop in the world that came and took care of us. So um, I've never had a problem with our police force, and I'm very proud of the men and women. And, when my mom was living over at Mark Twain, I met many of them when we pressed her little button and they had to come and help her get off the floor. Um, they were all very nice. So I guess what I'm here to say is this. I come to these meetings because I care about this town. I am passionate about this town. It is where I'm born and it's where I plan to die. And if I can be somebody who makes the town better, then I want to be part of that. But to come and criticize only and not come back with an alternative to how to make it better <coughs> is wrong. People are watching us at home. If you truly care about this town, then come here with a positive. And if you don't, then that's fine. 
And if you have an alternative, if you have something negative and you want to turn it into something, make a phone call to any one of these. Find people in front of us who are sitting here. Because you guys do a fantastic job for zero money, and I think everybody forgets that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Tina? I'd like to, because I was negative, but I deserve to be negative. And I'd like to say that. Sorry, name oh, and address. Tina Justra okay. Perez, 57 Thank Abbey you. Road. Appreciate it. That I'm on the Enfield Forum and I defend all of you guys. And I defend Thompsonville because they call Thompsonville a shithole. And it's not. I'm um, sorry. Thank you. You keep me on my toes tonight, Tina. It's, <laughs> hey, I'm from Jersey. Sorry. You keep me on my toes. Huh? You know, it's like Harlem. It's like Harlem. Everybody has their Harlem. Every town has a Harlem. But. But Thompsonville is nice. And now when I'm talking about, everybody thinks Thompsonville is the two streets, Pearl Street. It's not. North Thompsonville is very nice. All the places are very nice. You know, I left in 2004 and I cried. I went from Bergen County to Hartford County. I'm an immigrant too, just like the immigrants in Thompsonville. It's hard to leave your home. And you know what? A lot of them, when I had no family here, open my home. So I get insulted when people say the negative things about Thompsonville. I've had the best parties in Thompsonville. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to thank you guys for the ambulance. Because on December 10th, because Advanced Auto Parts was negligent, I went to make a U-turn. Please. Yeah. I'm sorry again. I'm sorry. I'm very impulsive when I speak. <laughs> and my car flipped over. And even though the woman police officer was rude and rude to the firemen, I had the best experience of my life. I was in excruciating pain. They had to cut all my clothes off, except for my underwear, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and when the ambulance came. This will be on public record, by the way. That's OK. <laughs> I don't care. I'm from Jersey. <laughs> anyway, Sorry, they cut ahead, all my clothes off. Yeah. Because I was in, and I cried. I was in excruciating pain. And I didn't want to go to Hartford. I didn't want to go to St. Francis. And I asked them to take me to Bay State. And they took me to Bay State. And for the second time, I got treated like a queen. The fire department was great. Even though the police officer interrupted him, he tried to make sure that I wasn't paralyzed. He did everything. He put me on the stretcher. All the people in the ambulance were great, too. They were wonderful people. You guys hired, whoever was in charge of hiring them was wonderful. Um, and I had a great experience. And when all was done, within six hours I was out of the hospital, I just chipped my spine. And I, I'm walking today, and my car flipped over, probably because I drove a Ford. <laughs> <laughs> 30, 30 seconds. <laughs> so I'm glad I amused you guys. Uh, you were buying people? American, at least, so I guess I can't what? say anything. You were buying American before. Go ahead. Sorry, oh, yeah, well, I work for Ford. I got to buy Ford. I get a huge <laughs> discount. You guys can get x -Plan if you want it, because you're my friends. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for listening to me. I spoke. I got to speak three times. So I got 15 minutes out of you guys, more than a lot of people do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for a sense of humor at the end. Appreciate thank it. You. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Anyone else? Bob? <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Ah. Bob T. Katz, Woodgate Circle. Why don't everybody get up and, get up and leave? Listen, I don't, I don't speak negative when I have the facts. I gave you a Stanford report, which Enfield is on its way down in school. This is a Connecticut mirror report about the performance of the high school. It's pretty bad. So why don't you, why don't you get together with the school board and see what they're going to do about improving the school system? Because that's the key. That makes Enfield. You, you look, look at the house values in Enfield, the, what people get paid in Enfield. We're at the bottom for the town of our size. We have to change that and straighten it out. The only way it's going to be straightened out, you have to, you have to come before the town council because 
All you say, we have a great school system, we have a great town, we have a lot of defects. And it's about time to talk about them and straighten it out instead of covering it up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Hearing none, I declare public communications closed. Moving on to item eight, councilor communication, councilor Sparaza, then councilor Riley, councilor Mangini, then councilor Kiner. Going this way. Then we'll come back this way. Go ahead, sir. I would like to um, just respond um, a little bit about uh, some of the things that I heard here tonight. Uh, let me start with, I heard the comment that the Enfield police are rude. Um, as far as I know, we have 95 individual men and women that work there. They all have individual names. Nobody's named Enfield police. So I guess I would say that if a person encounters an officer on a particular day and felt that they weren't treated fairly, the department has a very thorough complaint procedure that we follow. And if anyone feels the need to do that, they just need to go to the police department and it'll be looked into. We also have in-car camera systems many times. So if you allege something, um, it would be wise to be telling the truth because it's okay to complain, but if you're saying something uh, that's not accurate, uh, that, that would be a problem. In terms of staffing of the department, I, I do agree that 95 officers is not the right number. I think it probably should be closer to 105. That's what I would say. And I'll tell you what I base that on. Let me start off by making sure everybody understands. There's only 13 or maybe 14 police departments in the whole state of Connecticut that are nationally certified. We are a, a CALEA certified police department with distinction since 2006, or 96, I guess it is. Um, and when we look at staffing, I think the worst thing you could do is tie it to a crime rate. Now, I could be wrong, and I'm not going to put the chief in that position tonight. I believe a lot of our crime rates are on the decline, but I'd have him speak to that. I would also say that what, as a community, do we want from our police department? Now, I don't know about Wallingford or other places. How many people know that it is not a requirement to be an emergency medical technician to be a police officer? And yet, because we ran the ambulance, the police department ran the ambulance for so many years, probably 98% or 90% now of the department holds that status. Um, we are also the people that respond to your house when there's a medical emergency. We're the first responders. The police department are the first responders. Um, if I have an emergency in my house, I want them there 10 minutes ago. I don't think it's fair to compare our department with area towns like East Windsor, Suffield, or Summers. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's apples to apples at all. Um, we, we have been a leader in this community in terms of providing safety for our public in ways that maybe we can't quantify all the time. So maybe because we have officers patrolling all over town, the crimes don't occur, that would have occurred. We can't prove a negative. I guess that can't be proved. I can tell you that in our school system, God forbid, and everybody knows how I felt about this my whole life, God forbid we ever have anything close to a new town. There is no police department better trained, equipped, and can put 10 to 12 people in that building in less than four minutes. I don't have any children anymore in the school system, but if I did, I want them there. And I'm willing to pay the tax to get them there. Um, it's not nothing to be proud about, but we look at things like protective custodies. You know, that's when someone is an imminent threat to hurt themselves. Just a few years back, we had one of the highest rates of that in the whole state in our schools. And we historically rank as, as high. That's 500 people, 400 people. I don't know what the other towns are doing. 
um, opiate crisis. It's not an Enfield problem. It's, it's everybody's problem. It goes, it crosses all socioeconomic groups. And yet, we rank pretty high up there with that. So at a time with all these things upon us, and, and by the way, um, when we do have an armed person in a house, you know, the goal is to resolve it with no loss of life to the, to the perpetrator, to our officers, and to the public. <laughs> the best way we can ensure that but not guarantee it is we are members of a crest team, a regional SWAT team that can bring 30 to 40 officers from surrounding towns here with armored vehicles to try to fix it. So, you know, everybody has a right to an opinion, uh, but I don't think you could take a community, this community and this community, with the same number of people and say we need the same number of officers. You know, there's some departments, you got your bike stolen, they take it over the telephone. They don't show up. Is that what we want as a community? I, I don't think so. That isn't what I want. And I just needed to say that because, um, you know, I'm not saying that people don't make mistakes wherever they do, wherever they work. But I got to tell you what, um, it's unfair to categorize a whole group because on a particular day, perhaps an officer, the perception was he or she was rude. And I'm not saying they weren't. I'm just saying, why would we, why would we paint the whole department uh, if, if an officer had a bad day? And the last thing I want to end with is this. Um, I heard the comment that every town has their Harlem. You know, I've never, I've never lived in Harlem, uh, but I got to tell you what, I resent and, and re reject the categorization that people in Harlem are bad people. And I think that's what the implication was. So there's good people everywhere and criminals everywhere. And I, I don't think it's fair um, to represent a whole district of millions of people, just as I don't think it's fair to go after the police that they're all rude. And um, I certainly recognize that a lot of people listening and watching this tonight are going to say, what do you expect? You know, you worked there 40 years, right? I guess you can believe that if you want, because it's true. But the truth is, what I'm saying is that the people in the police department are like anybody else. They have tax problems, marriage problems. But you know what? When you call them, they're doing the best they can. And when they don't, then there's a, there's a process for that. But it's just unfair categorically to just say they're all rude, um, not doing their jobs. So thank you for thank indulging you. me in that. Councilor Riley, Councilor Mangini, then Councilor Connor. And then, me. then we'll go on this side. We're, we'll go with Joey this way. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to speak to Mr. Young's last uh, paragraph that he talked about the circuit breaker and the elderly credit. Uh, we all got an email from Senator Kessel's office um, asking if we wanted to put any requests for bills um, in their session. So on the 27th of January, I sent him an email asking um, if it's possible to go back and uh, have the state start funding the, um, the tax credit again for the elderly. Um, I cc'd it to um, Mayor Ludwig and Deputy Mayor Suzak, and they also forwarded it on to uh, Carol Hall for me. Um, the response that I got from Kissel's office was that uh, they would work on it, see if they could add it. Um, Carol Hall was not as optimistic that we would get anything like that back, um, but I put it out there because I thought that it was important. Um, to Mr. T. Katz, um, there's a lot of things that play into the school budget that we have absolutely no control over. If you send an email to um, Chairman Krizel or um, Christopher Dresick, ask them for a list of all of the unfunded mandates that the state of Connecticut requires the school boards to provide for, and they don't pay it. I mean, you're talking about administrators. Those are state mandated. Yeah. It would be great if the state would just pay them directly, and then we would be out of that. But they're state mandated. We have to have them a ratio, they have their certificates, 
that's the way that it goes. Other costs like increases in pay and salary, that's, I mean, we negotiate with them, but that's out of our hands unless we want to get rid of binding arbitration right now, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, you know, even costs like just diesel fuel for the buses, um, the number of kids that go to special education, uh, those costs rise and we have no control over the kids that go there. If more come into our district, we have to provide for them. Um, there's attorney fees. There's all sorts of fees that we don't have any control over in the school budget. Um, so those are also things to consider. But I would definitely urge you to get a list from the school board of all of the unfunded mandates that we have, because I think that you would find that number quite staggering. And then I want to end on a good note. Uh, first readers, trivia night is on February 22nd, 7 o'clock at Mount Carmel. And I just want to give a big, huge shout out to Mount Carmel because for eight years in a row, they have donated their facility to us so that we could have our one fundraiser for the year. And I think that's incredible of them. And I just wanted to say thank you to them. And to all the donors that have donated so far, to all the prizes, a lot of people are sitting up here that donated. And I just want to say a big thank you to everybody. And that was it. Councilman Jeannie. Thank you. I um, am not a police officer. I don't have any law um, enforcement background. But, and again, um, my colleague, um, Councilman Speraza was our chief and did an exceptional job. He speaks better about police work than I ever will. But I do want to uh, echo his um, thoughts and his position on our PD. We are very fortunate in our town to have a police department of such caliper. And I say that because, again, according, you know, to to Carl, he, he's absolutely correct. People do have bad days. But our police department is is professional. Our, our officers are held to the highest standards. And the reports that I get back and the experiences that I've had have all been Positive. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you have issues sometimes and uh, police officers have to intervene. But it's unfair to say that our, you know, police are not um, courteous. And again, to some degree, that may be the case. But don't paint that picture because overall, we have a very professional police department, very uh, well trained. And I, I agree with Carl that we should increase the number of police officers in our town. We warrant that. And if we could, I'm sure that we would. So thank you, Carl, for saying it so very nicely, what you said about our police department. And then I also want to clarify education. I'm a realtor, and many people um, that are home new home buyers first time home buyers uh, young families i deal a lot with the millennials the gen x is it gen z's um people are coming to enfield primarily for our public safety and our educational system um, they do their research and they like what they see in our schools and what um you know, my, my colleague Charlotte just said, there are many unfunded mandates that we have no control over, and we must comply with state rules. There, there's no way of getting out of it. But to rob the children of supplies and good quality teachers, no, I would never support that. So I just wanted to make <clears throat> that very clear. And then I just have one more point. And to <clears throat> through our mayor, to our town manager, um, and Chris, I'm, I'm just going to, I shared this with Donna earlier. It was brought to my attention, um, the Daughters of the American Revolution, I'm, I'm an officer, I'm the treasurer. Apparently, back in uh, May of 2018, uh, there was a resolution that the town of Enfield owns the Thomas Abbey Monument in front of the Enfield Congregational Church. And the resolution pretty much states that uh, the town... Uh, agreed by resolution to accept the monument for it to always remain upon the site upon which it is erected as long as it's maintained, repaired, and kept good condition. And the town desired to update and clarify maintenance responsibilities. Now, the, I guess that begs the question. There was supposed to have been um, a subsequent resolution as to how 
when and who is going to do the maintenance. That statue is dirty. And um, Bill Lee, Councilman, our Deputy Mayor Bill Lee, a couple years back, and a couple of the Boy Scouts got together and they went and they cleaned it. But this resolution, or the following resolution, which I don't have a copy of the subsequent resolution, um, appears that the town is responsible for maintaining that statue. And I'm wondering if we could research that. Uh, and again, it was the minutes are from May 18th, 2018. So there must have been a sub, I'm sorry, May 21st. There must have been or should have been a subsequent resolution. And if not, was it dropped? Because it's not being maintained. And it should be because it is one of our historic sites. So I just wanted to bring that forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. What I'm going to be saying is probably falls within the realm of a public service announcement from the Enfield Together Coalition uh, to those people who are viewing the, the council meeting tonight. Uh, the coalition wants to get the message out that if anyone has unused or expired medications, they're saying, please do not throw them down the toilet, down the sink, in the trash can. You might see boxes around town saying, take it to the box. I know, Joey Bosco, you've got this big sign there on, on, on Raffia Road and Simon Road, and thank you for that. And um, all this means, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> is that if you have any drugs that are expired or not being used, go to the police station, drop the medications off there, and that's the safe and just the, the right thing to do. And the other thing the Enfield Together Coalition asked me to say tonight is they're having a health and wellness fair on May the 16th, and you'll hear more about that as time goes on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Gina, before I go to the other side, I want to make sure. I want to make sure. Councilman Bosco. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Just a few things. One, I want to echo everything everyone said about the police department. I, I wish Tina was here because I just want to let her know, and when I finally see her, I have to tell her, we have no control on who builds a house because someone buys the land, it's a free market, they do what they want to do. Uh, all we can do is make sure to build an inspector, make sure it's done to code. Um, also, uh, there is a board of tax appeal, so if someone thinks that their house is too much, the Board of Tax Appeal meets, you show them the evidence, and then it goes from there. Uh, next thing, uh, I don't want this to sound the wrong way, because this is sort of a compliment for George, but um, without people like you looking at things, like when we had Mrs. Zidniak and Mrs. Collins and, and Jack, there's things that we miss. But the only thing I ask is, on something like this with the square, just for your, because you're a very smart man. So what I would say is just go see Chris the day before because all this stuff could get answered to you and a lot of this stuff is done in executive session and yes, we do, we scream, we yell, we complain, but then there's only so much we can do about it. But I wish you would talk to him on a lot of these things because then you would get the true understanding, not just this three minutes over here of stuff that he can't really go over because it, it is pretty involved. And um, the problem is sometimes when you come up and you say things, it makes it sound like we're not doing our job. And, and, and I know you don't mean it that way, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to, because like I said, I always say things, and they always come out the wrong way, but... I know you're trying to do what you think is best to try to help us do our job. So it, it just really would be very good if you just like make an appointment the week before, talk to them, get your answers, and then come back and you know, you know, say what you need to say because then you'll know what you got to say and you'll get your answer right away. Um, I hope that you do come to the budget meetings, because then at that point there, you'll see how much we argue, we fight, we go to try to save a dollar here and, and whatever. And then, you know, you may just pick something up 
You'll be sitting there with your budget book, and then that's why you don't have to be here and say, hey, line 92, because we already beat line 92 because you brought it up to our attention, and, and we fixed the problem before we come in and vote on a budget. Um, so that, that's, that's where I wanted to go there. Uh, there was the, the school education in a school. I totally disagree that we have a terrible uh, school system. We have a great school system. Um, a lot of times the school system is what you put into it. My niece just graduated another class at the Naval Bates in, in North Carolina. She became va valedictorian or whatever is equal to a valedictorian. Uh, she is for um, nuclear. When she went in to go into the Navy, she was the highest scoring person in the, the, this whole area in years. So we do produce very bright children. It's, but my sister-in-law did a lot of work with her while she was uh, going to school. So, you know, you, you get out of what you put in. And we do have a very good school system. And it really bothers me when I hear that we don't. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of kids that graduated the Anfield High Schools making big dollars. So that's where I'm going to end it at. Thank you. Councillor Hemler. So uh, economic development, I think, is super important for the success of uh, Enfield. So I'm always happy to announce uh, a new business in town. And I hope that every council meeting I can talk about one or two. Um, a new business opened at uh, 786 Enfield Street. It's a CBD store. I went down there. They had a ribbon cutting. And I met the owners. Um, They're really excited to be in town. So I just wanted to say welcome. On, uh, January 23rd, Mayor Mike and I went to the American Legion Post 80. They celebrated it 100 years, and Mayor Mike presented them with a uh, town proclamation. So that it was an honor to be there and be part of the be part of the meeting. On um, January 29th, I was at tonight in Thompsonville. It's uh, it's an event that's. Um, it's sometimes monthly, sometimes quarterly. It's held by the ERFC, and they uh, they do a great job. They educate uh, families um, and and have um, educational games for the kids, and they, they always have a meal, so I usually go and serve. It's at St. Pat's. Um, I want to announce again that the Opera House has their next show. It starts this Friday. I'm excited to go to it. It's uh, Legally Blonde. And it starts this Friday. It runs for three weeks. And it's uh, Friday night, Saturday night, and no, Friday night, Saturday day, Sunday day. And uh, there's still tickets available. So I hope you can go. Thank you. I just want to remind the residents the 4th of July committee dinner dance is coming up. It's Saturday, March 7th from 6 to midnight at the Old Country Deli. I also want to just correct a statement that was said earlier that. Uh, not everyone supported. We supported the JFK Building Committee, and where I'm a liaison on the committee now. I was also on the committee with Donna on the high school committee for five years, so we support that and believe in education. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Okay, better set the clock. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you know, it's sometimes we say we don't listen to each other and people don't, I mean, we don't hear what's going on, but um, last year we, we listened and we redid our alarm ordinance and uh, guess what, we're now listening again because, you know, we inadvertently put in the alarm ordinance that um, if you're not registered on your first false alarm, you're going to get fined $90 and that's a fine for the false alarm, not for not registering. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of people that did not realize that they were supposed to have their alarms registered. We were relying on businesses to get out the word that we should be registering our alarms. We've since, I, Chris can tell me all the things we've done. We've had uh, a press release. We've put it on Facebook. And I'm going to talk about it right now, that you need to register your alarm. But in the interim, you know, I've talked to the people on public safety, and they're going to go back in and look at this. And this um, will now be um, appealable, hopefully, once they look at it, that 
if you're not registered and you have a false alarm and you're going to go in and you're going to talk to the hearing officer, make sure you've gone to the police department and registered your alarm. The other thing is you can go down to the police department and check and see if your alarm has been registered. Um, I thought it, the person who really got to me was the person who in nine years did not have a false alarm and was not the person in charge of putting in the alarm. And they went down and when they got down to the hearing um, for an appeal, they said, oh, this is not appealable. And by state statute, these things need to be appealable so we will have a process. So everybody go register your alarms. Guess what, they're all in District 3, so it must be Chief the safest part of town to be in. So that being said, District 3 has the Scantic um, River Watershed Association hosted the um, Super Bowl hike. And they hired a um, Colonel Hazard um, impersonator. And we walked through the hollow and uh, we learned all probably 150 of us, just so you get an idea of how many people, and thank you for not sending the police to ticket all of us that were illegally parked because we filled every parking lot down there. Um, we actually walked all through the hollow, learned about the process of um, the manufacture of gunpowder. It was manufactured for 77 years in the hollow. Um, I, I guess we kind of, you know, with all the OSHA standards and all the things that we lose sight of the, the dangers that people faced every day. And, you know, these people had a very, very dangerous job, and it is part of the heritage of the Hazardville Village. So if you ever have an opportunity, please. We, I know we're looking at maybe getting him to do another um, presentation. He actually gets dressed up and everything in um, what the uh, regalia that the Colonel Hazard would have worn. So that was a good thing. And, every, and all the donations went to the food shelf. Okay, so business now motion to suspend the rules and move items b1 b4 e f g h i j k l m n o to miscellaneous and proceed to vote so motion to suspend the rules made by deputy mayor suzak seconded by councilman Mangini. is there any discussion on the motion hearing none by show of hands all those in favor <laughs> opposed abstentions motion made and carried anything else no, that's what okay. special needs of the council. All right, since <laughs> folks have been long-winded, I'll be very brief. Um, you better be. You know, I believe in continu continuous improvement. I also believe that we should be honest with ourselves, and we all can improve. And I agree our school system can get better, because our goals are pretty simple. We want to be number one in the state of Connecticut. We're not there, obviously, but our goal is to get there. But part of that, there's some good stuff going on. And if I recommend it, I'm not trying to push one organization, but the Enfield Pats does every every quarter have a long list of our college kids who are attending many different universities and many different disciplines all over the Northeast and quite frankly part of the country who are meeting the Dean's List and doing very special things as Councilman Bosco's niece are. So we certainly look to improve and we're willing to do anything to get better, but there are some good stuff going on. And for example, you know, they, you know the, the girls rock, right? On the girls' high school basketball team, which right now is headed for the state tournament as is the boys' basketball team and the, and the hockey team, 16 out of 23 girls, they're all eligible, and 16 of them are on high honors. So they're balancing sports, all the other things they're doing, probably jobs, and they're making high honors. Can we improve? We better believe it. Everyone here is committed to improvement. But again, there is some good stuff going on, and sometimes you just got to open your eyes to see it. Real quick, I know I've asked you this, but I want to make sure, because I'm a little bit dogmatic, through you at your next meeting, can, can I request a, once that report for the fire districts is ready, can I request a peek at it, at some, or the council, excuse me, at some point before it's made public, supposedly in May? Just a quest when, when you meet with the fire commissioner's next meeting. Sure, live right now from your lips, it's going to their ears. But I'm very anxious I will, to see that report. I'm very anxious to see that well. report. And, uh, and just in, uh, hopefully, again, you notice things around town and everyone does their own thing. But again, sometimes you just, you like your, People who are in a good mood is contagious. Contagious. There's a certain tax office on Hazard Ave where they have certain employees, and one in particular who is always dancing, who is always in a great mood. And if you've ever driven by there and you're in a bad mood, if you don't beep the horn and wave, 
then I'm not really sure there's a lot we can do for it because the, the individual is always doing a great job. I don't know his name. I don't know, but I got to admit, it makes me laugh every time I drive by there and I'm beeping a horn. So keep up the good work because you do actually make some people smile. So there's nothing wrong with that. Moving on to town manager report item nine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I like to hear all of the comments from our residents. And you know what, whether you've been here for two or three generations like the Bosco family or your family that moved here last week, um, your opinion is valued and it's important and I like to hear from you because a lot of the people who move in have a lot of good ideas and they come to me and they tell me why they moved here like a family the last week and it was because of the education system in particular the early learning center at Stowe they had looked in other towns and concerned about daycare and, and um, how difficult that is and the quality and concern for your for your children they had waitlisted and then feel and waited uh, and then moved here because of the extraordinary program we have. I, I don't want us to figure out because one extraordinary thing that the board and the council collaborated on, and I think w as time goes forward, our state um, uh, education commissioner and others are, are looking to have us share it. And there was a meeting that the uh, mayor went to, Tom Arnone, uh, the superintendent about area schools, uh, who were just absolutely flabbergasted, and I think that's the word about what we did at Head, Head Start and moving those students to Stowe and bringing back some of our students from around uh, the state where we spend quite a bit of money. Um, not only the, the, the cost of it fiscally to the budget, but the cost, the human toll, the emotional toll on those students. We were able to bring back many of them to Enfield to a state-of-the-art Eagle Academy uh, where they could be proud to be back and be part of Enfield. And we have other towns that are knocking on our door that want to bring students there. So we're doing some remarkable things. Are we perfect? No. We're a work in progress. Uh, I like to hear from everybody in regard because I take those grains from, even if somebody's negative, you know what? We don't have really the right to say. People have a First Amendment, they get impassioned. Sometimes it comes across negative, but I will say when Bob says facts, facts are stubborn things, and sometimes um, we don't like to acknowledge them. But it's a lot nicer, Mayor, like you said, to see that young fellow. I've watched him for years outside the tax office being happy, go lucky, being a cheerleader, right? Mr. Kiner, I think you can get a lot more done being positive and trying to um, promote the ideas in a positive way and still get your point across. Um, to that end, a, a couple of Remarkable things. Uh, I received an email from Tom Arnone. I sent it to all of you this morning. Some excellent news for the town. Economic uh, news that he was at a legislative or meeting this morning uh, with Johnson Memorial, and they publicly announced a 34 to $38 million expansion of their Enfield campus on Hazardville Avenue, where they'll have a state-of-the-art geriatric wellness program right here in Enfield for our citizens. That's incredible and that's excellent news. Again, as a collaborative, the way we work together, we have one of the best youth services programs going back many years, continued by this chief between the police department, social services, and the school department. Again, at the legislature last week, they had hearings and people, they commended Enfield on our suicide prevention, so much to the point when they heard about the programs that we offer and what we've been doing over a decade, uh, the commissioner, Stephen Hernandez, asked Enfield to come and present at the next State of Connecticut Commission on women, children, and seniors, what we're doing in, senior, in suicide prevention, collaboration between between all of the, the schools, also as Nuntuck, EMS, police, and fire, and recognized as a state leader in this initiative. So no, we're not perfect, but we are doing a lot, and sometimes we rest on our laurels and we don't tell uh, the public, and people are watching this show, and I think it's important to get the good <coughs> news out too. To that end, I'd like to say last year, uh, the mayor and I went, we went to his Nuntuck. We had students who have a um, program they're from South Korea. There were about 20 of them last semester. Now, I don't want to have a wardrobe uh, misfit like we do with my tongue because the name of the university, and it's a little scary to pronounce, Kai Young Dung University. <laughs> And again, this year, they've, they've come back. There's 14 students. I went there last week with Kasha, and we welcomed them. They're doing dental. They're looking, and they're a great partnership. They've come to Enfield again, and they told me because they love the housing at Bigelow. They love the school system. They love the shopping. They love the magic bus. So we have a lot to offer. And I will tell you, Kasha isn't here this evening because to continue, you just can't rest in your laurels. Everything changes. We, we've 
clearly looked at our budget. Where can we spend money most wisely? One of those areas is youth services. So we do get grants federally, and there was an excellent program in Washington, D.C., where we have our consortium that went. Um, Council Lori Ungeyer is there. We have people uh, from youth services. We have people from the Board of Ed. And Kasha went to, and they, I looked at the program because we scrutinized. We look at those details now to see what are we getting. It's going to be an extraordinary program, and I expect for them to come and do a presentation from 6 to 7 to share that with the council and our residents as well. So I think we're doing a lot of exciting things. And as Councilman Bosco said, I'm always happy to sit and talk um, with Mr. Young or, or anybody else because he does bring some valid points. But you're right, executive session is difficult because of the rules of pending litigation and we don't want to jeopardize the town's position. The, the, our town attorney, Jim Talberg, wasn't really here. That litigation was for the last couple of years. But I can tell you the town attorney's office did a very good job on it. Um, and when Joey says there's yelling and screaming in executive session, just want everybody to be clear, the yelling at the town attorney is not me in, in, when they're yelling. but. Nobody can say we're happy about the result. All we can say is that we're happy that our staff planned for it. Um, to make up the million plus dollars a year, Mr. Young, it's gonna be a Herculean effort. It's a huge deficit to, to come up with that money in our grand list. Unfortunately, they do an assessment. Things change over the ensuing years, especially with malls and squares. It's a national trend, just not in Connecticut. And I can only tell you, we did it kicking and screaming, but after the fact, there are appraisers for both sides that look at it, and unfortunately, they said the mall is worth half of what it was. Now, what's the good news? Because I'm a good news, half glass uh, is, is Phil kind of guy, is that what the planning and zoning did the other night with the square, I am hopeful and guardedly optimistic it will be the steps towards a resurgence in that square. And I think we're gonna see things coming forward from speaking with them to bring that up. And hopefully, Mr. Young, those values will go back up and we can tax them and try to recoup that. But for me to try to say it was a good thing would be like trying to put uh, lipstick on a pig. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but we just tried to, you know, as we said, as the mayor said, that our staff planned for it and we did the best we could. Um, Mr. Tcats in regard, I think it's important just in the sound system. Um, there's new tiles in the roof acoustically. We've had people come in. We went out to bid on the ETV and the HD system, which you put in last year's budget. will be upgraded hopefully by March. As Mr. Uh, Tcats said, it's really this is an excellent system. They're not replacing it, but it doesn't work too well if you don't turn the mic on. So we have to remember to do that. Uh, and then there'll be other improvements with screens. It'll be enhanced, and that hopefully will be coming to us in March. Uh, so it'll be a much more pleasurable experience for those at home watching the um, meetings. I would also say, uh, in regard to the police department, because it's too big an issue to just let lie, and I know people have spoken about it, but we do have an excellent police department. And again, it's not perfect. Uh, I stress customer service with all of our directors, including the chief of police. We have directors meetings. He goes to his staff meetings. He tells his officers, and I know this to be true because I've heard him say it, you are ambassadors to the town. Be careful how you conduct yourselves. And you're right, chief. No one's... I'll uh, we'll use this word again, no one's perfect, some people have bad days. That's not an excuse, however, when you're a police officer, and if somebody doesn't live up to the mark, the chief talks to them. If you have a, and I've had very few, mostly it's accolades I get and notes commending officers for extra, extraordinary conduct. But if anybody believes that they've been treated uh, discourteously or an officer was impolite, the chief wants to know about it. I want to know about it. But for the most part, they do a heck of a job under sometimes very trying and stressful conditions. Um, you know, it is absolutely true that we have more police officers than some other departments, but it's apples and oranges, isn't it? Um, I could have the chief probably cut 20% of the police department and we could still put patrol officers on the road and answer calls. What we wouldn't be able to do is what we do and do remarkably well <coughs> is have the specialized units that we have. We wouldn't have canine officers who interdict the dangerous and poisonous drugs in our communities on a daily basis, who track down missing persons, who go into a, a building in a dangerous situation so our officers don't have to, have to risk their lives. We don't, you're right, have to do that. But if we do, we need more officers overall. We don't have to have the traffic division, metro traffic, and our reconstruction squads. What does that mean? Well, that means when we have fatal accidents in town, we won't do them. We won't do the investigation. We won't have the capability. We'll wait for the state police, and they've had cutbacks. And when they are able to get here, they'll do the investigation. And of course, by that time, uh, critical evidence may have been lost in the prosecution of the case. Uh, 
we don't have to have the Crest team, as the chief said. That's our SWAT team. We have five officers who are part of that. They're leaders in that, as most of our officers who participate in other departments become leaders and teachers. And if we don't have them, then that means likewise, and there's been cutbacks at the state police. If there is an armed suspect, a barricaded suspect, we will wait hours for the state police to come and we'll pray as we stand around the perimeter waiting for them to come. We don't have to do that now. We have that unique specialized team that comes. And also, by the way, we have those five officers on duty, pretty much one or two of them 24 hours a day with that equipment and knowledge in their car. You're right. We can reduce the number of officers and we can dispense with that squad. We have SROs in the schools. We've now done enhanced SROs. Do you have to do that? No, some communities still don't, but we do but we need more officers to do it. We have an officer who we've placed in the DEA to help fight and eradicate drugs in this town. And I'll tell you, the chief gives me updates. There have been remarkable successes. We don't talk about them. We're shortly going to, because when we are involved in this, we get a percentage of the in-rem forfeiture. So when they seize uh, money or homes or property or cash, we get a part of that. The chief gave me a list of where we are on that. It's remarkable. Can't talk about it quite now, but when that money comes in, it can be then used to enhance drug enforcement in the town. We have a detective bureau. Some towns don't. And you know what? When terrible things happen, a sexual assault or a homicide, again, we can wait for the state or we can give it to a patrolman. God bless them. They're juggling a lot. They'll get to it. But would you rather have an experienced detective that's investigated and is a forensic expert in uh, sexual assaults who's done 150 cases a year or the patrolman? who just got assigned the case and he's been on the force two years. We have officers who are part and they have their forensic experts for child sex crimes on computers. We have experts who are forensic experts in crime scene investigation. And you've seen we have in our budget for a new crime scene unit to go out and preserve evidence because if you don't preserve it, the case can be lost and tainted forever. And lastly, we have a polygrapher. So we are able to actually bring people in who want to voluntarily submit themselves. If you're telling the truth, come on in and we'll give you a polygraph. Um, we have that capability, and also when we do background investigations for officers, we save thousands of dollars a year because we can do it in-house. You're right, 95 sworn officers. If you want to give up any or all of that, we can discuss it in the budget, but understand there's a consequence and a cost. We have the finest police department in the state of Connecticut. We have the finest public safety in the state of Connecticut between our EMS, our police, and our firemen. We are unparalleled in the state when you call 911. The services you get in Enfield are the finest. We've been recognized. We've got awards tonight in the paper, and the chief's coming up because we're doing an MOU with the United States Secret Service. And like so many other press releases I send to you from the U.S. attorneys about uh, the prosecutions, convictions, and imprisonment of serious felons in the federal courts, they emanated from the Enfield Police Department. And I couldn't have timed it any better, I'd like to take credit, but there was an article in the J.I. tonight, uh, our U.S. Attorney John Durham announcing a huge counterfeit ring nationally that was broken and arrests were made in Enfield by the police department that contributed to it. So yes, we could do less, but we will get a lot less. So I submit to you, it's money well spent, but the civilian board for Enfield police, they're right there. And they're right here. So thank you. Anyone have any questions for the town manager? All set? I just, Chris, want to pick up one thing. You mentioned uh, the meeting I, I want to highlight because Representative Arnone was there, myself, and, and the superintendent of schools. We went to kind of a legislative breakfast. And again, we are reaching out to our neighbor. So I personally handed my card to the mayor of Bloomfield and said anything. If you'd ever want us to come down and do a presentation, we'd love to do it open invitation. We also made the invitation to the state senator who's down there, who's the head of the State Department of Education. So again, uh, working together with our state partners to, again, show folks how it can be done by working together with like-minded communities to improve education from birth to 12th grade. So publicly, we, we, I, don't, I don't want to put Bloomfield on the spot, but we made that outreach to them. We're more than willing to go down and help them if they, they chose so choose. So Enfield is definitely a community who's willing to reach out to our neighbors and help them, especially when it comes to early childhood development. And again, having child first here shows that we're not afraid to address those tough issues because those are very tough, and we can't, we can't let those kids slip through the, through the cracks. So it's very important to us. Um, town Attorney Report. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, two things real quick. We're going to be offering training to volunteer members of boards and commissions uh, with regard to discrimination laws with an emphasis on uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's going to be sponsored in conjunction with the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. We don't have a date yet for it, but it'll probably occur in March. And uh, once uh, we work out the logistics, we'll give further details. Uh, the Office of the Town Attorney has been working with Steve, the town's HR director, and um, Lori Witten, the director of De developmental services, to try to uh, pick the right target audience. And depending on the venue and how long it's going to be, we're not sure if it's an hour or a two-hour block, we may make it available to town staff who would likely uh, confront these issues. And then we're going to supplement that with, at the last town council meeting, I made an announcement about an important decision that came from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals with regard to uh, municipal uh, indemnification of employees and defense obligations. And so we're going to couple that to try to uh, allay concerns that may have arisen for volunteer board members and uh, town staff as well. Uh, so more details will follow on that. I just wanted to give you a heads up. And then secondly, Councilman Bosco, uh, you had asked for an update on the solid waste uh, ordinance, and so uh, Attorney Elsden met this week with Don Nunez. My understanding is they have a draft uh, of either uh, an amended ordinance or a replacement ordinance that will be referred to your committee for discussion and debate. And that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for the town attorney? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Moving on to item 11, special, any reports to special committees? Deputy Mayor Suzak. Okay. Okay, so later on this evening, you're going to have the um, three resolutions to start the phase three of the Henry Barnard School. Um, I guess you know, we have a lot of new members to the joint facilities. The joint facilities committee, in order to receive grants from the state of Connecticut for our roofs or our work on the schools, this committee has serves as the building committee for the roofing projects. We also served as the building committee for the pre-referendum committee. Um, it's one of, we've, <laughs> this committee like fills every, um, stop that needs to be stopped along the road of getting our infrastructure back in in um, in working order so this summer we are hoping with funding that we will be doing the henry barnard phase three start phase one of the eli whitney school and phase one of the hasville memorial school and in the fall we will be going for a roofing referendum which will include school roofs and they will include town roofs so um, Jeff uh, Linowitz, I'm hoping you're saying, is, has done a really great job of um, organizing everything. And Gina's named this. It's concurrent planning, where I was um, stubborn on going to referendum until I could be guaranteed that we would continue on the roofs and go to referendum because as Mr. Young has pointed out over and over again, it is really hard to stay in within the referendum limit. This phase three is a perfect example of that. The, to finish the roof would have been a quarter million dollars. We did not have a quarter million dollars um, within the two budgeted years for the roof at Henry Barnard. We were about $40,000 away. So now we're going for phase three. And, uh, but in the interim, we found uh, we're going to do the chimney as well. We had pointed out to us that the chimney is in um, desperate need of repointing, and there's a maintenance issue with the new furnaces that the water that a high efficiency boiler produces needs to be discharged higher up out of the roof, and we're going to take care of that too. So I think having a facilities manager and having a committee that um, is dedicated and committed to you know our infrastructure has helped substantially and please when you go in and you vote for a referendum consider the fact that we're asking because this work needs to be done we're not asking if your opinion is that whether the roof is leaking or not so thank you any other co reports special committees hearing none moving on to item 12 old business on page one, appointments A, one, and two stay on the table. Do I have a motion to remove item three, Enfield Beautification? So moved. By Councilor Muller, seconded by Councilor Riley. All those in favor of removing from the table by a show of hands. 
Opposed, abstentions, 10 in favor, zero against. Do I have a nomination, please? Yes, Christine Sarles. Motion made. Second. Second by Councillor Riley. Motion to close. Motion to close by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Second. Second by Councillor Muller. All those in favor of closing nomination, let us show of hands. Opposed, abstentions, 10 in favor, zero against. The main motion on the floor, the nomination. Do I have any uh, comments or concerns? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Christine Searles. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Sferraza. Four. Con uh, Deputy Mayor Suzak. Christine Searles. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Christine Searles. Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. That's 10 4. Christine, none, abs no abstentions. Thank you. Moving on to the top of page two, items four and five stay on the table. Do I have a motion to remove item six from the table and field beautification committee? Um, yes, I uh, would. Council, this is the motion to remove the table. Yes. Council Mangini, second by Council Muller. All those in favor by show hands removing from the table. Opposed abstentions. Uh, Council Mangini for a nomination, please. Yes, I'd like to put forward the name of Roberta Ladd. Motion made. Second. Seconded by Councillor Sakala. Do I have a motion to close nominations? Motion to close. By Councillor uh, um, Sparazza, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. All those in favor of closing nomination by a show of hands. Extensions, 10 in favor, zero against. Any questions on the main motion? Hear none, roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Roberta Ladd. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Sparazza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Roberta Ladd. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Roberta Ladd. Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. That's 10 members, four, none against, no abstentions. Moving on to item seven through 16 on page two, remain on the table. Moving to the top of page three, town manager appointments. Items one through 14 on page three, remain tabled. Moving on to the top of page four, items 15 and 16 remain tabled. Do I have a motion to remove so item 17 from the table? So moved. By Second. Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Mangini. All those in favor of moving from the table by show of hands. Opposed, abstentions, 10 in favor, zero against. Do I have a nomination, please? Yes, I'd like to bring forward the name of Roger Russell. Second. Motion made, seconded by Councillor Muller. Is there a motion to close nominations? So moved. By Councillor Sakala, seconded by Councillor Muller. All those in favor of closing nominations by show of hands. Against, abstentions, 10 in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion and nomination? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Roger Russell. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Council Sferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Roger Russell. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Roger Russell. Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. That's ten in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving under uh, moving on under old business to item C appointments, planning zoning commission appointed, council approved. We have none. Item D, the discussion on school roof replacements, again, remains tabled. Yeah. Moving on to item 13, new business. Item A, consent agenda, we have none. Item B, appointments by the town council under new business, we have none. Item C, under new business, appointments by the town manager or council approved, again, we have none. Item D, under new business, P and Z commission appointed, council approved, again, we have none. Moving on, excuse me, to item 14, items for discussion. Item A, the consent agenda, we have none. Items B2 and B3 remain on the on the table. Item C, town manager uh, appointment, council approved, we have none. Item D, P and Z, commission appointed, council approved, we have none. We move the rest of the items, B1, B4, E all the way through O, move the miscellaneous. Um, Mr. Mayor, B1, we'd like to make the appointment of Stephen Nimitz. Oh, it's, called, it's in miscellaneous. Okay. It's all part of miscellaneous. Okay. Yeah. So we're moving on to miscellaneous. So we move on to the top. Um, B1, Prison Liaison Committee, a, re um, a, re a reappointment for Mr. Nimitz. Do I have a nomination, please? Yes, I'd like to uh, reappoint Stephen Nimitz. Uh, motion made Second. by Councillor Sakala. Do I have a motion to close nominations? So moved. By Councillor Muller. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Opposed, abstentions, 10 in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Stephen Nimitz. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Sferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak. Stephen Nimitz. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Steve Nimitz. Councillor Hemler. 
four. Councillor Kiner. That's 10 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving on to item B4, do I, again, a, re a reappointment of Mr. Slade? Do I have a nomination? Yes. Councillor Muller. Timothy Slade. Motion Second. made, seconded by Councillor Sparazza. Is there a motion to close nominations? So moved. By Councillor okay. Muller, seconded by Councillor Sagala. All those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Abstentions against, 10 in favor, zero against. Is there any discussion on the main motion? Hear an unroll call, please. Councillor Mayor Ledwick. Four. Councillor Mangini. Timothy Slade. Councillor Muller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Sferraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Tim Slade. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Tim Slade. Councillor Hemler? Four. Councillor Kiner? Four. That's 10 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Under miscellaneous, moving on to item E. Discussion resolution, resolution reclassifying responsibilities of safety officer position and amending the executive secretary job, executive secretary job description. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 7, Section 2 of the Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby amend the job description for the Executive Secretary. Submitted on January 24, 2020 by our Director of Human Resources, Steve Belinda. So moved. By Councillor Muller. Second. By Councillor Mangini. Welcome, sir. Mr. Mayor, yep. I'll give him the intro to give some background, and this is really bifurcated. This is one half of it, and the Chief of Police is here to address the other half. As uh, you've seen, and since last year when my tenure started, we, we constantly revisit positions. Uh, during the budget, we look to see, for department heads and others, should we have additions or subtractions. But mid-year, we'll look at them if there's an opening and we have funding left, and it's a critical job to the organization to be filled. Um, we just don't fill it. We look at it to see if it's still something that we want uh, to leave in its current form. Um, I think Mr. Young at the last meeting, uh, kudos, had said, you know, sometimes you can share responsibilities, look to others and the individuals within the organization instead of going outside, hiring a new person with benefits uh, and retirement considerations as well. So we did that. This position is a prime example. You had the registrar of voters a couple meetings ago. They, they came up with a similar situation. But this position initially in the budget before last, and we did it mid-year, was called the uh, Environmental Health and Safety Officer. It was something that was created by prior councils. It was open. It was about a $65,000 plus uh, with salary and benefits. And it was sort of a highfalutin job description for a job that didn't really require it. So when it was open, I looked at it. And what we did is, and the council agreed, we divvied that up. We hired what we really needed, which was a third blight officer. It's been tremendously successful. We made our CEO full time because we're a busy town and we needed to do that. Uh, we, we changed the job description within this to have a safety officer, much more practical and common sense approach uh, for uh, $25,000 a year, which Steve will address. And lastly, then we remunerated our hearing officers for all of the different alarms and uh, sidewalk and appeals that we have. We were having difficulty keeping people to come because we didn't give them any kind of stipend. So we addressed it, and that's been quite successful. Um, we filled the job on the one part. They've all been filled. They've all been great. But recently, I'm very happy to say that the person who was doing the uh, safety officer portion of the uh, breakup was Norma Baldini, and she was so successful at that Chief Fox uh, stole her away and made her an Enfield police officer. So the job became vacant. Uh, I'll turn it over to Steve now. We reassessed it at that cost and value and determined the money could be better spent to accomplish the goals, but also accomplish some others. So just welcome, sir. Uh, just name and title for the, for the record. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Belin. I'm the director of human resources for the town of Enfield. So just echoing what the town manager was saying is that, yes, we do uh, evaluate and assess key positions. And since Norma was reporting to me, um, I went and apprised the town manager uh, saying that Norma did great things. She brought... Uh, uh, electronic efficiency, so we now have consistency for our workers' comp injuries reporting. She did the safety survey. She did a lot of one-time efforts that, once it was set, it was, that was it. Um, and if there's no injuries where she has to go and do a lot of uh, investigations or follow-ups, um, unfortunately, there was a lot of dead time, and I was having her do clerical work. And that's not the highest and best use of someone at that salary level. So. Thankfully, the town manager let me have a, a clerical position at a much more appropriate rate. And what we did is decided that the safety officer position, instead of a $25,000 position, it's really more of a $10,000 position. But who can we hire someone with only $10,000? So we decided it was added, better to add these responsibilities to an existing person that has the uh, wherewithal, the names, the uh, 
and, and just give a little bump up there. That's less person that we have to hire on the, on the tax rolls. So um, with that, that's what we decided to do. And um, it's, I anticipate it's going to be a very efficient process. They're going to be, um, it'll be out of the town manager's office, which is near and dear to the town <coughs> manager's heart, uh, for the executive safety committee and the, um, the legally required quarterly meetings uh, by the state of Connecticut. Um, so I'm looking forward to a, a seamless transition as we offload these responsibilities from a part-time position to now with just an added responsibility to our current position. Yeah, it's a critical function. I mean, we realize in the, in the initial ideation of the uh, environmental health and safety, you really don't need a PhD or a master's um, for us to come up with a plan that when it's icy in the town hall parking lot or any t other town buildings, that we should, wow, we could put pails of sand and the employees could spread it w until B&G can come back. So that's what we looked at, and that's what we've been doing. I'll tell you, a few years ago when I was doing um, uh, the safety officer role to some degree um, in a larger or smaller context as part of public safety director, we tried to use common sense. We had some out of control costs with insurance and workman's comp. We've worked so hard over the last few years that we're going to be having a report coming up in the budget to see the remarkable savings we had. We've reduced severity and frequency of claims. This is injuries to our employees, which hurts them and their families, which causes a backfill, which causes a deficit and a reduction of services to the people. It also, the, the second effect is by keeping our employees safe, we're keeping our citizens safe. We, we reduce the amount of injuries. It's been a remarkable effort. In a lot of towns, and I work closely with it, I chair the executive safety committee. I chair the town safety committee. Many communities don't do that. It's delegated. I know how important it is to keep people safe, so I've maintained control. In looking at the recategorization re of this, I like it being in my office. Kasha, the assistant manager, is going to have some oversight. If you know my executive secretary, Deborah, who's taking it over, She's tenacious. If you have a report that needs to get filed about an injury, it's going to get done. If you, we, we need an investigation to say, how could this have been avoided and what do we do to uh, stop it in the future, she's going to be the one working with directors and overseeing that, together with questionnaires and other things. So we thought it was a good fit. I like to have direct oversight. Some people say I like to be in control. I don't know where that comes from, Chief, but I do like to know what's going on. And this is important, so I think it's an appropriate um, division. And if there's questions, you can ask Stephen, then we'll bring the Chief up when you're ready for the second half of the, the funds. It's $25,000. We're using 20 and we're returning 5000 to the fund. Again, every penny, every dollar, we look at it, it's like it's our money. So I didn't just say we're using the $25,000, let us spend it all. We said it's appropriate for both positions to, to be compensated for $10,000 and we're returning $5,000 because you know what? Every $5,000, $10,000 here, there adds up to a mill rate eventually. And we're, we're very good stewards fiscally of the money. We look at every penny. Council Sraza. Chris, I'd like to um, thank you for doing it this way because it would have been much easier. You had the money budgeted already in the budget. You could have just replaced the person. But the fact, and you too, Steve, that you looked at it and said, you know, can we do this because it's important and do it at a more cost efficient way. And you know what? I, I certainly support this. and. Um, I think sometimes when we have titles, people get confused. They go, safety officer. That's nothing to do with the police department. Mm -hmm. But this is how important it is. Like Chris said, we have employees that get hurt on the job. We don't want our employees hurt. We don't want the public hurt. Um, we don't want it because it hurts them and their families. But beyond that, it's a loss of productivity, which results in a deficit for us. So what the safety officer, or now what Debbie's going to be able to do with this, is it's like a central repository where every department head is going to fill those reports out the same way. And it's not just filling them out and filing them. It's actually like having the meetings like Chris always did yep. to say, you know, what's a short-term solution so it doesn't happen? So not only is it a double win for us, we're, get, we're getting the work done for 10000 but at Correct. the same time, it's an important function that will save us money down the road. So yep. that's all. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Again, I just want to acknowledge you guys well, in this entire council, because we've done this for over two years, where we made a commitment to, again, try to be more efficient where we could, you know, find jobs that we felt with the town really needed, and to be flexible. And the entire council has been committed to that. And I think, you know, this is important because, again, we're trying to, we're trying to give employees who want more, op more opportunity, more responsibility. We're giving them that chance if they so, so choose to want it. 
which is really all you can ask as an employee in any organization that you work within, whether it be in the town of Enfield or whatever job you work in the private sector. Yeah. You know, so I think, I think these things are important because I agree, every dollar does count. And five grand is five grand. Yep. Five grand is five grand, so thank you. You're welcome. So the second part of this. Um, we have to vote on this oh, and oh, you sorry. guys will come. So we, roll call, please. Four. Councilor Mandini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Ferret Sraza. Deputy Mayor Zuzak. Four. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Hemler. Four. Councilor Kiner. That's 10 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Under miscellaneous, moving on to item F. Resolution adopting the civilian services manager job description. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 7, Section 2 of the Town Charter of the Enfield Town Council. The Enfield Town Council does hereby amend the job description for civilian services project manager submitted on January 4th, 2020 by Steve Belinda, our Director of Human Resources. So moved. By Councillor Muller. Second. Seconded by Councillor Mangini. Welcome, sir. Welcome, Chief. Good evening. Thank you very much. So we'll turn to floor, or Chris, or right over. Yep. Mayor, just as a, a bit of brief background again, um, this is part of a process. Not only have uh, the HR director looked at job descriptions across the town to make sure what people are doing comport with what their job description is. That's very important under labor law, uh, and so people know what their job is. So we update them as times change. But also we try to ad address key areas where there's a need. One area several years ago when the chief uh, was chief uh, in dispatch, that is a very stressful environment to be in. And people are making life and death decisions. So a couple of things over the years that developed. One, we needed a supervisor for the dispatch. We couldn't just rely on one of the officers, a sergeant or a lieutenant, uh, who might be on call to come in and assist them and give them guidance and help with the division of work, um, because that isn't their primary job. So we developed a supervisor and we hired a Mr. Steve Hall, who was a former Connecticut State Trooper, a sergeant, came in and did an incredible job. Likewise, Last year, again, Steve did an assessment working with the fire chiefs who were reviewing dispatch, again, knowing how critical it is to EMS, police, and fire. Because let me tell you, uh, and the chief will reiterate, how a call starts out sometimes determine how it ends. Bad information in can have a bad result at the end. So it's critical to have a, a robust dispatch. And we have a review committee comprised that we meet with uh, EMS, police, and uh, fire to to oversee that. But we, we realized as well um, back the year before last that we had lower uh, salaries than any other area. And we would get excellent. We'd go through the entire process, the chief and Steve and their committee interviewing people only to lose the candidate to another town because we couldn't compete. The council addressed that and they appropriately raised it now with that supervision and then out of the dispatch review. And I'm proud of these things because I think it's just so innovative and our, our staff thinking out of the box to make everything better and trying to do it at, at a good cost or within the budget. We came up with also to have different on each shift, a supervisor within dispatch. We never had it. What a remarkable change. It's incredible. We've attracted some very good people, and we're very, very happy uh, with how dispatch is doing. But it's always a work in progress. I'll now turn it over to them to, to tell you similarly what's going on in the division where now we seek to use the same skills of Mr. Hall to assist in that area, hopefully with the same positive results. Gentlemen. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. So uh, as we shared a moment ago, the dispatch center is running extremely well, and I thank you for the support that you've provided up to this point. Um, inadvertently, but perhaps not unexpectedly, what we have noticed, and this is really a, a, a two-fold fix that we approach you on, we have inadvertently but unexpectedly created a pay compression issue as to Mr. Hall. He's about $15,000 below his contemporaries in a survey that was done. And I don't know that I would have approached you simply to fix the pay compression issue. Having said that, at the same time, and this, as I understand it, has been an historic issue, the records division does very good work. The work they do, however, is also very, very specific. And there is, frankly, not a degree of direct oversight as to the records unit. So in an effort to fix both issues, issues, and at the same time that the money became available because of the safety officer position, uh, Mr. Hall and I had a discussion with Mr. Belinda, eventually to the town manager, and that's what brings you here tonight, but what brings us here tonight. I believe that through the reallocation that's before you, we're in a position to address both of these issues and continue in the progress that's been made so far. Steve, I don't know if anything before, are you good? Anyone have any questions? Councilor Straza? Chief, I just would say, um, having worked with, with Steve Hall all these years, uh, what an outstanding 
candidate to do this job. And for the public's sake, so they understand records, it's not just filing and, and traditional record keeping. These people in records are dealing with sensitive reports, confidential reports. Timeliness is of the essence. If they're not at court at the right time, the judge is not happy, DMV. Uh, they have to acquire skills that other uh, administrative or, or, or uh, secretarial folks don't with the NIBRIS and the, and the uh, NCIC collect. And um, it, you're absolutely right. Everything is so specific that we never did have a supervisor to help assist when they're falling behind to get them help, redistribute, reallocate the work. And this is going to pay uh, tremendous dividends for us. So I certainly, uh, you know, Thank you. It. Steve Hall does Steve Hall does not know how to say no. Oh, Steve that's, Hall that's takes right. whatever it is that's given to him and right. he runs with it. Right. Um, and then on the second part, yes, the work is highly technical. Right. Uh, and much like there was no direct supervision of the dispatchers, right. to ask a police officer to do it wasn't realistic. To have a police officer supervising records is not realistic. No, and having the, the uh, lieutenant or sergeant having to do it's not realistic because you know what? When that pursuit goes down and they're not monitoring that call, it's not going to play well that why well, was paying attention to the records department. Okay. So thank you. And also, Correct. Mr. Mayor, what we're trying to do is return police officers to the police function, which is to be on patrol and be part of the units we discussed before. The chief is working towards that. I'm very excited in this next budget. There's a position that has been held by a police officer doing an incredible job who will be retiring. He's come up with a plan to have a civilian do that and to the next replacement for that officer, he'll be on the street. And we're trying to do that throughout the department so that we use resources where we should. So we're not using highly paid, skilled police officers to do more civilian work. And I will tell you, I love them, sergeants, lieutenants, but you know they're great at a crime scene, they're great overseeing other officers. Their forte really isn't to oversee dispatch and civilians and people in records. You're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. So we're really addressing these issues, I think, quite nicely in the police department. Anyone have any questions? I don't know if you want, I mean, you know, you know, Steve all does a great job with emergency management, all the things. I don't know if you, a little comment there. I mean, I know, knock on wood, we haven't had a storm to prepare for, but I know this might possibly happen this weekend. I mean, just the, what he does there, I mean, you got a chance to, don't be afraid to say a little bit about that, because again, that takes, we all get the emails. I mean, there's like 100 people on there. We're going to talk about us coordinating, not only with in town, but with our regional partners and, you know, that stuff takes, again, those little things are really very, very important. We hired him as a dispatch center right. supervisor. Right. We tasked him to be the EMD. Right. He takes care of the cars. He takes care of the infrastructure inside the cars. He assists with a lot of technical things. And all the training he goes to. I mean, those are things when people talk about our preparedness. It and really is. It's, I, I mean, we. I know we can't display it for everyone because, again, there is some level of privacy there that we have to maintain about our how we do things. But, I mean, it really is impressive. No, and part of that, he oversees the Emergency Operations Center, right. which is not only for storms, but in the last scare and with the, you know, the, the flus, the coronavirus, we consult with him. That's part of his job functions as well. He also oversees for me, and as I've said in the past, and we, it's, we always work on this every year, is our sheltering. Uh, which is a complicated. He, he oversees that. So there's a lot more to it than just weather-related items, and he does a remarkably fine job. Chief, he, he also, unless he changed it, is he still in charge of our alarms, compiling those statistics? Yes, sir. That? He's doing that, too. Yes, sir. Any other further qu comments or questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councilor Mangini? Four. Councilor Muller? Four. Councilor Riley? Four. Councilor Sferraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Four. Councilor Basco? Four. Councilor Sakala? Four. Councilor Hamler? Four. Councilor Kiner? Four. That's 10 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving on to item G and under miscellaneous a discussion resolution request for transfer of funds for the town management and communication division of $10,000.74. Resolve that $74 in accordance to Chapter 6, Section 8 after the town charter. The following transfer is hereby made to town manager and two public communications, uh, $8,936, to emergency management of, I didn't do the math, of a little over, do I have to be exact, 1000 to from human resources of 10000 a little over $10,000. Certification, I hereby certify the above funds are available as of January 27th, 2020 by John Wilcox, Director of Finance. 
Approved by Christopher Bronson on 130 2020. So moved. By okay. Councilor Muller, seconded by Councilor Mangini. I didn't have time to do the quick math. So this is just the transfer funds that we just talked about. Any questions from anyone? Roll call, please. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Sferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak. Four. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Hamler. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. That's nine in favor, none against, no abstentions. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you. both. Item H, discussion resolution under miscellaneous. Resolution authorizing the Joint Facilities Committee to serve as the building committee for Henry Barnard Roof Project Phase 3. Resol no. Resolve that the Town Council does hereby appoint the Joint Facilities Committee to serve as the building committee for the Henry Barnard Roof Construction Project Phase 3, prepared on January 24, 2020, by the Town Manager's Office. So moved. Second. By Councilor Muller, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Welcome, sir. Name and title for the address, and you have this floor. Good evening. Uh, there we go. Chris Cycley, Construction Solutions Group, uh, Owner's Project Manager for the Barnard Phase 3 Welcome, project. Welcome, sir. Thank I mean, you. so I know, quick hi, I mean, Phase 3, kind of what we're... I right, so as uh, Councillor Suzak uh, mentioned earlier, the Phase 3, the balance of the roof replacement at Henry Barnard School, we were um, about... Two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Was the was the balance to do the uh, the the last section of the roof? Uh, we didn't have the funds then, uh, so we are now uh, resulted in having to submit yet again a third application for this school project. So uh, the next council meeting, I will present the um, uh, the estimate for you all to to approve, so that we can actually will at that point we'll then submit the uh, the grant application. Tonight's just for the three. Uh, uh, early resolutions. Any questions? Just curious, I don't know if you know this answer. Do have we have applied for any of the reimbursement through the state for the first two projects? Yes, we have. Mm -hmm. Have we gotten it yet? Uh, we have received the reimbursement for phase one. That is currently an audit. Uh, reimbursement for phase two is pending. Yep. Um, and then the audit will, will shortly follow that, and then this will be submitted. We'll, we'll, so if we have it by the budget to be able just to be able to. John, I don't know if John can answer that. Will we have actually money from the state reimbursement by the time we discuss the budget, just so we can again show why we're do we we chose to do it initially this way? Um, when I budgeted for these projects, I budgeted for the revenue to offset the cost of the project. So right. Well, I'm not questioning, but I'm just saying when we actually get the money in house. I will. If we have it, I will. I'll All right. The Board of Ed's just voted to accept phase two. Correct. And they're, they, because it's a, it's, it's a very delicate process to get the money. I understand, but I want to make sure that we actually document when we get it, because that's We, we have documented I, phase yeah. one. What's, what's that timeline you're referring to about uh, when you say? Here's we'd have by the time we're discussing the budget. Just when are you going to discuss the budget? We started in April. No. Uh, you might have it by the end of April. Okay. Right, there fine. is a possibility that you'll have it, you'll have the reimbursement by the end of April. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Anything else, sir? Uh, no. Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Mangini? Four. Councillor Miller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Savaraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Hemler? Four. Councillor Kiner? Four. Nine in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving on to item I, discussion resolution, resolution authorizes the preparation of contract document drawings and specifications for the Henry Barnard Roof Project Phase 3, resolved at the Enfield Town Council, hereby authorize at a minimum the pre preparation of a contract document drawings and outline specifications for Phase 3 of the roof replacement at their Henry Barnard Ro School, excuse me, pursuant to Chapter 173 of the Connecticut General Statutes. Submitted on January 24th, 2020 by the town manager's office. So moved. By Councilor Muller, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. I mean, it's, I don't know if you anything else you want to throw in, but it's pretty. No. Yeah. I same same spiel. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have any comments? Thank you, sir. Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Riley. Four. Councilor Sferraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak. Four. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Hamler. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. 
votes. Nine in favor, none against, no abstentions. And moving on to item J, discussion resolution under miscellaneous. Resolution authorizing the Board of Education to apply for a roof construction grant for the Henry Barnard Roof Project Phase 3, whereas the Henry Barnard Elementary School roof needs replacement, whereas the town is eligible for school construction grant for roof replacement through the State Office of Administrative Services. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council authorize the Enfield Board of Education to apply for the State Department of Administrative Services to accept or reject a grant from the, of the, for the replacement of the Henry Barnard School Roof Phase 3 submitted on January 24, 2020 by the Town Manager's so Office. Moved. Second. Deputy Mayor, uh, by Council Muller, seconded by Council Mangini. Any questions? My only question, I apologize, when will the Phase 3 work start? At, at the end of school in June? The end of school. End right. of school? Yeah, it'll, uh, July, June, July. July. And simultaneously we'll be doing Henry Barnard, what's the other school we're doing? Eli Whitney, Eli Whitney and Hazardville Memorial. Okay. Oh. I, I guess my comment is that, you know, the, this is a, an involved process that we all have to do, and it's well worth it. It's a 70% reimbursement from the state, but that's part of the decision that to go out to referendum that we would have our funds more readily available to us so that we could do these in the least amount of phases, not the most amount of phases possible. So I, I'm hoping that our citizens are listening and paying attention to what we're doing because these roofs, some of them are over 35 years old. And, you know, we weren't really aware of these things until we started looking through because we have to show, you know, when these roofs were um, accepted. Some of them were accepted in <coughs> 1983. So I think with better documentation, this will become a little bit more second nature to the town. But it does show that, you know, we do need to have, you know, better lookup systems and a lot of, uh, you know, expenses, expended time effort on keeping everything square and and I'll reiterate the that 70% reimbursement rate will apply to the future roof projects uh, if we go to referendum. if you go to referendum correct you, you know I think the key is and I know we that committee <clears throat> the meeting and you you guys were hired I think the first year in but really since that committee was formed over two years ago you know the JFK referendum was for, was put together you know that group worked on that got it passed knock on wood groundbreaking starts in two months the roofs, yeah, you know, all the roofs, the work you've been doing, Henry Barner basically will be done in the spring. Or excuse me, I'm sorry, the summer. We're summer. starting other two roofs. Contract. Yeah, the performance contract, the recommendation for what we may or may not do at the dump. So I mean, that committee has done a lot of work. Yes, there's still work to be done, and that's the good news of it. We have plenty of work to do, but I mean, there is a lot of stuff that's already been done. So I mean, I know you're involved from your group and the committee. I mean, the fact that we got Henry Barner, we're not going to avoid have Henry Barner done is pretty impressive after where we stood about a year and a half ago. Anything else from anyone? Again, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Mangini? Four. Councillor Muller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Sferraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Four. Councillor Basco? Four. Councillor Hemler? Four. Councillor Kiner? Four. It's nine in favor, none against, no abstentions. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Have a good night. Moving on to item K, discussion resolution. Resolution authorizing the town manager to sign a memorandum of understanding with the United States Secret Service. Whereas the United States Secret Service oversees the Connecticut Financial Crimes Task Force, currently consistent of multiple federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies charged with the investigation of certain complex financial crimes. And whereas the task force functions as a working group within the, town, within the Enfield Police Department, can draw on United States Secret Service expertise and assistance when needed in, in furtherance of the investigation of a certain complex financial crimes occurring within the town of Enfield. Whereas the ta this task force membership may provide for certain overtime reimbursement that would would otherwise be borne by the town of Enfield as well as possible end of year asset sharing in such cases and whereas this agreement is is terminable at any time upon a mutual agreement of both parties and is terminable within 30 days notice by any at any one party and whereas the Enfield Police Department has been invited to become a member of its task force now therefore be it resolved the Enfield Town Council does hereby authorize the town manager to enter into this memorandum memorandum of understanding in furtherance of this task force membership submitted on January 17 2020 by the Enfield Police Department so moved by second. Councilor Muller, second by Councilor Mangini 
Welcome, Chief Fox. Thank you, you sir. The floor, sir. There is no downside to this MOU. These are cases that we would be working anyway for certain complex financial crimes. By entering into the MOU, however, and this is a specific invitation from the Secret Service to do so, we are able to access their resources for assistance in these cases. Let me be clear, this is an ad hoc sort of task force. It is not someone being sent down to New Haven and we're losing them from, from, from our town. Um, and additionally, if the case goes a, f a parallel federal prosecution route, which is why the Secret Service is interested in, in creating this partnership, they reimburse for our overtime expenses, which we otherwise would have borne, and we line up by being a member of this task force for the possibility of asset forfeiture sharing at the end of their fiscal year. Uh, it's win-win-win it's all the way around. 26 participating agencies at the state, local, and federal level, with seven in the pending status. Anyone have any? Council Straza. First of all, Chief Fox, I saw in the paper tonight, and I'm so proud um, that our police department was instrumental in cracking that counterfeit ring that stretched from Virginia all the way up to Connecticut. And I think it illustrates that it's not always the detectives or the forensic stuff this was an individual that went to one of our local stores, passed a counterfeit bill, and because of the quick response of that officer, not only the quick response, but once he got there, he knew the proper questions to ask, and I believe if I have it right, they uncovered at the scene uh, $50 sheets and $20 sheets, and later on that led to the confession. So. Uh, it's great when we're recognized by that. I certainly would support this. I like the idea that we're partnering with federal law enforcement. This town has a long history of that. We've done it with our state, with our federal, FBI, DEA, ATF. Um, and, and there's another reason I'm very proud to support it, because despite what's going on around the country these days, we are being true to the, our oath that our officers take to uphold the laws of the state of Connecticut and the Constitution. And when a federal law enforcement agency, whether it be Secret Service, FBI, DEA, um, wants to work in conjunction with us, I'm proud that we could do that. So I'll, I'll be supporting this. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, sir. Anyone else have any comments? And I, um, I always say that it's great that we work so together. So go ahead. I, I just, I don't want to interrupt you. I just have one, one question, Chief. Yes, ma'am. With the partnership that we're forming yes, with this um, federal agency, we, our Enfield PD is still going to be in charge of any crime. Is that correct? They're not taking over. Well, that is correct. Please understand, as a, as, a, as a general legal concept, the feds can assert jurisdiction and run a parallel federal prosecution okay. in any case without our consent. Bank robbery, kidnapping, drug offenses uh, would be certain examples. This would be, these would be financial crimes, credit cards, counterfeit money, negotiable instrument, bearer bonds, any instance where the Secret Service has jurisdiction. We could have a state prosecution at the same time they're having a federal okay. prosecution, uh, but it would not be a tug of war, which I think is the import of your question. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. You know, again, I think it's, we talk about private-public partnerships, all the things we're trying to create, and it's great to see actually the levels of government working together. Thank you. Which is a very important partnership that a lot of things times is taken for granted. And I think yeah, I agree. It's, I mean, the more cooperation we have with our state, local, federal, regional, uh, whether any kind of police force is great because it keeps the town safe. Thank you. And also gives some valu valuable experience, I'm sure, to our officers as well. That when you work with other different, you know, you know, constituencies within the same kind of public safety umbrella, you do learn different things from different departments. These are individuals that right. know one area, multiple areas, but they know specific areas and they know them very, very well. Uh, allowing folks like Mark Granato, who went to the Dick Sporting Goods when this case started, to learn how these cases work. Yes. And my only uh, ask is when we do, when we are working and good things happen, like we just he heard about the counterfeiting, again, we need to have press releases on that. Yes. We need to show the folks that we are working very closely with all levels of government to the benefit of Enfield. Of course. So I appreciate the fact that, again, given the, the people who deserve the credit, the, you know, the credit that they deserved. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else have any comments? Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Mangini? Four. Councillor Muller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Sferraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Hemler? Four. Councillor Kiner? Four. It's nine in favor, none against, no abstentions. Moving under miscellaneous. 
Thank Thanks you, sir. ladies and gentlemen. Night. Appreciate it. Uh, item L, discussion resolution under miscellaneous. Resolution referring from the referring the proposed conveyance of the land to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Whereas the town of Enfield, otherwise known as town, owns a property located at 2 Broadbrook Road. And whereas the town intends to market and sell this property with the services provided by the town's vendor for real estate agency services. And whereas the Enfield Town Council must refer this proposed conveyance to the Plan Planning and Zoning Commission for a report in conformance with the requirements of Connecticut General Statute 8-24. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the proposed conveyance of 2 Broadbrook Road is referred to the Planning and Zoning Commission in conformance with the requirements of Connecticut Ge General Statute 8-24, submitted by Nelson Teresio on the Deputy Director of Economic and Community Development on January 22nd, 2020. Motion made by Deputy Mayor Suzak, second by Councilor Muller. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Any questions? I don't know. No, anyone? Um, no. And these two uh, resolutions, the uh, setting the public hearing and the conveyance of land, they're going to be um, sent off to, or the land sale is going to be sent to Century 21, all points. Is that correct? Yes, that's who the town has contracted okay. with to sell. I, I'm going to have to abstain both of these votes because I am an independent contractor for Century 21, even though I'm not going to directly um, receive a benefit, I will indirectly receive a benefit, and I just don't feel comfortable with this. Thank you. All right, and Nelson, Teresa, will give us more information at the public hearing. Right. This is just to refer it um, to Planning and Zoning and set the public hearing, and then the specifics of the property known as the Grange, uh, which is in question here, will be discussed by Nelson yep. at the next meeting. Any other further comments or questions? Here, none. Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Muller? Four. Councilor Riley? Four. Councilor Sparaza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Four. Councilor Bosco? Four. Councilor Hemler? Four. Councilor Kleiner? Four. That's eight in favor, none against, one abstention. Moving on to item N. M, excuse me, under a miscellaneous discussion resolution, resolution setting a public hearing for the conveyance of land. Whereas the town of Enfield owns the property located at 2 Broadbrook Road, Whereas the town council has referred this matter to the Planning and Zoning Commission, also known as the Commission, for a report in conformance with the requirements of Gen Connecticut General Statute 8-24. Whereas the Commission will make a recommendation pursuant to the above ref reference statute at its February 13, 2020, 2020 meeting. And whereas under certain conditions, Connecticut General Statute 7-163E requires the legislative body of a municipality to con conduct a public hearing prior to the sale, lease, or transfer of real property owned by the municipality. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby schedule a public hearing regarding the conveyance of 2 Broadbrook Road to be held on February 18, 2020, at, to begin at 6.50 p.m. in the Enfield Town Council Chambers of the Enfield Town Hall, where is, which is located at 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, in order to receive public comment. Again, submitted by Nelson Teresio, uh, Director of Public Economic Development, Prepared on January 22nd, 2020. So moved. By Joe second. Muller. Second by Councilor Muller. For, motion by Councilor Muller, second by Councilor Riley. This is just to set the public hearing. Any comments? Hearing on roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councilor Muller? Four. Councilor Riley? Four. Councilor Sferraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Four. Councilor Bosco? Four. Councilor Hemler? Four. Councilor Kleiner? Four. That's eight in favor, none against, one abstention. Moving on to item N on the N under miscellaneous discussion resolution, a resolution entering a tax stabilization agreement with Next Era <coughs> Energy Resources. Whereas Next Era Energy Resources intends to invest substantial capital into the solar facility located at Broadbrook Road, and whereas Next Next Era Energy Resources has requested a tax stabilization agreement over a 20-year period with the Town of Enfield. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Town Manager, Christopher Dober Bronson, is empowered to enter into a tax stabilization agreement with Nextera Energy Resources, subject to review and approval by the Town Attorney, in the name and on the behalf of the Town of Enfield, submitted by the Town Mayor's Office on January 24, 2020. So moved. Councilor Muller, seconded by Councilor Mangini. In general, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, John is here to answer questions. Um, it is not a tremendously complicated agreement. The council has had it uh, to peruse, but it has been worked on. It was submitted by Nextera. It was their request to us, uh, which we uh, have favorably looked upon as staff. Uh, John, uh, Della, 
Kosh has worked very hard on it. The town attorney's office has done a, a tremendous amount of work to fine tune the language in the agreement to make sure it's fair to both parties, but also safeguards the interests of the town. What this is, quite simply, and then you can ask John any further inquiries. Um, Nextera is coming to town. It's about 130 plus acres. It's a solar farm, 19.5 megahertz. I believe that's the terminology. Megawatts, megahertz, megawatts. There's all kind of virtual reality. I, I can't keep up. But it's large, one of the largest in New England. So what they've asked of us, what the legislature has enacted over the last couple of years, is our ability to enter into a tax stabilization agreement. It's not a tax abatement. Um, this isn't in any way reducing their tax obligations to the town. What it does is because these properties are primarily composed of, his, of personal property, and normally the taxes are... Uh, graded. So when they build it and they're estimating this is about $21 million uh, apart from the real estate, that the tax obligation to them at the beginning is higher, then it's depreciated over time over 20 years and it becomes lower. The legislature saw a need and other communities have enacted this because they like consistent and predictability. They don't want to be paying $500,000 to start even though they may pay $200,000 in 20 years. So the legislature said, look at towns, you and your finance people, your tax people, you can look at it um, to, to a degree, it's part of looking at a crystal ball. John can explain how we arrived at this, but he kind of had to look at what is our grand list growth over time, take the averages and come up with an amount. In this case, it's $319,000 for each and every of 20 years. And the safeguards are in, in the agreement. If they were to leave early, they have to pay back what the, um, the reduced cost was. Um, and they're obligated to it for the life of, uh, of the 20 years. Uh, lastly, there are other real estate taxes. There are other parcels here which are going to generate about $75,000 a year in real estate taxes apart from this agreement. This does not encompass fire district taxes. They still owe those. And in fact, we're authorizing it tonight. They have a representative, Mr. John Ravosa Jr., whom they've hired, who is listening in here. He's been active uh, with some of their other representatives to get this thing uh, completed. But ultimately, you'll authorize me to sign it. We've been working with them. We'll send it to them. If they sign it, we've got a deal. If they don't, then they will simply be obligated to pay their taxes under the normal course uh, of business when they complete the project, whatever the amount is. If it's $21 million, their initial uh, taxes will be higher than the stabilization, stabilization agreement is, and they'll pay them. Clearly, we also put in, and John did, that if, in fact, uh, the estimate of $21 million is really $28 million when all is said and done, then the agreement will be adjusted accordingly. We'll use the same ratios and formula, but it obviously will be more. Um, so with that, the staff recommends it. Uh, we'd like to see them. They were uh, approved by the Connecticut Siting Council. Um, we've had a lot of dealings with them over time. I think it's beneficial to the community. I think they'll be a good partner. And we would ask uh, for favorable, favorable consideration by the council this evening. Anything, John? Uh, pretty much, I think Chris uh, summed everything up. Um, you know, basically, the... Uh, if they paid taxes according to their, um, you know, the 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 actual tax rates, um, they would be paying about five hundred thousand dollars in year one, um, and we, we would start um, collecting more in years seven through twenty, um, as is the tax as the depreciation on the business personal property goes to a lower amount, so. I mean, we'd be collecting less as the year, less as the years went on. If if we collected according to the actual tax rates, um, then we would collect less in right. years seven through okay. twenty right. than what they will be paying. I, I just had a couple of questions. So how how do we when I guess when will we know the tw the twenty one million? So what if it's twenty three million or when does that get determined? Um, once the project is complete, complete, and they submit their um, their first property tax declarations, and, and our our office's assessment will be involved, in it, I would assume. That's correct. correct. Yes. Right. And just curious, um, so do we have after we if we approve this tonight? Once Chris signs it, is there X amount of days for them to sign it? Is there any kind of thirty day provision, forty five or? Just curious. I mean, I'm just saying. I don't want it. We do this, and then six months from now, no, we don't have a signed agreement. Um, there is not, um, but they. I know they are interested in getting started, mainly because the ground is frozen now, and they need to get on it while it's frozen to right. do laying clearing and stuff like that. 
I believe they wanted to get this agreement signed and out of the way in order to um, have that certain cost certainty um, so that they could uh, you know, pr proceed with the project. Yeah. I just hope there are no other changes come back. That's all I'm going to say publicly, and I'll leave it at that. Deputy Mayor Suzak. I guess to be clear to everybody out there, this does not include the land. They'll still be taxed on the land. The landowner will still be taxed. This includes the land that Next Era or Nutmeg Solar will actually own. The land doesn't There's, depreciate, though, does it? No, it doesn't. So the 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 land value is pretty much flat. Okay, for okay. the 20 years, and I build in an. an, an but the land that they an, don't own will be paid by the the land. By owners. the landowners, that's correct. And and building how far as building permits go, will they um, have building permit fees for the foundations? As I'm not completely uh, familiar with any. I don't know why they would not have any, but um, okay. I'm not. I'm not Just familiar. so that everybody, you know, we know a lot of information here, but we're trying to disseminate information to everybody out there. And, you know, these are probably questions that if we don't ask, Mr. Young's going to come up next week and ask us or in five minutes. So um, hopefully, you know, I, I can think of what he might be asking. So I thank you, John. It's been a lot of hard work. Right. No, no, seven, any other questions? Subject to utility permits and approval. Well, you can go ahead. John, just quickly, Mr. Mr. This, Mayor, this is, the town attorney has a Let me just weigh in on that question. Sure. I didn't know if you wanted to do a question and answer, but uh, right on page one, there is a whereas that the project will be specifically subject to further construction in public utility permits and approvals by the town, just like any other project. Great. And as I had referenced in the beginning, there's about the other real estate we're talking about is about seventy-five thousand dollars additional to this agreement. Thank you. So, John, just quickly, um, this is a twenty-year. They're going to pay the same amount for twenty years. If five years into this, the state legislature were to enact some type of uh, legislation that would be more favorable to these projects, it wouldn't apply to them. They would still contractually be obligated to fulfill the the contract for 20 years correct it is my understanding that would be the case i don't there are no clauses in this contract that allows them um to to get out for reasons of that nature okay thank you any other questions and, and to be clear for the public record this is being taxed as a residential piece of property even though it's an industrial use which was part of the reason going through the siting council. Again, so again, it remains as a residential zone property, which for the town does have benefits, so we don't have to go through the industrial, you know, changing it to an industrial use, so once they're done, we could something else could go in there. However, there is, I mean, the stabilization, there is some benefit to the new owner of having it taxed at a residential rate as opposed to an industrial rate. I mean, I think that's important for people to understand. Um, that is correct, yes. Yep. Mr. But Mayor, at the end of 20 years, it'll still be available. Right. I would just ask that uh, Councilman Sfraza re ask his question so the town attorney might be able to answer it yeah. more appropriately than the fine instructor. So, you know, I understand it's a 20 year stable, stable rate, it's a, it's a contract, bilateral contract. I understand that. My question is if five years into this, the state legislature were to pass some legislation for these type of energy projects that would be more favorable to them, they would still be obligated under the original 20-year contract. There's no provision in this contract where they can, subject to legislative, like we could cancel this project, correct? Well, you'd have, that's a good question. Uh, who would, who would, uh, which would have priority? The state legislature voiding a private contract? Uh, I can't answer that right here and now. Uh, I, I, I simply, I, I, I just can't answer that. So it's, po you're, I know you can't answer it, and I know there's no talk of it, yeah. but I don't know what the state would do down the road. So five years in, they go for these types of projects, you get 50, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but we have a pre-existing contract. So would state law trump our pre-existing contract? You know, having done probably a little more municipal in the contract area, 
I would just add that I think the state could always preempt. If the state specifically said this this voids and vitiates any contracts now and here withstanding, they'd preempt this. So could the federal government. Never seen them do it. And more, moreover, the most important part of your question is we didn't provide for it, though, voluntarily, uh, Counselor. So, so, it would so have to be in other words, we didn't put in. And this also, they may choose to uh, more favorable legislation if it is enacted hereafter. So there's no voluntary way to do it. They're bound by this. I don't think the legislature would do that to towns because it destroys, really, they're trying to give consistent predictability for taxes. We've done that, and now they're going to turn it on its head by saying in a few years, oh, well, throw that out the window, and we're going to start something new. So you can't be 100 percent sure, but... Yeah, I mean, I think as a general proposition of law, the state legislature could preempt private contractual rights. I think they avoid that. I can't think of a, a comparable situation where the state has done that. Okay. Off the top of my head. All right. Thanks. Well, you're right. It sort of voids, voids the stabilization type well, idea, right? My, my only ask. Uh, but then is, again, it's the state, yeah, so that's why fair. we leave the caveat. My only ask is after we, we get an update after 30, 45 days to see if that, we actually do have a joint signed agreement. Well, one one last point on this. So, if the concern is that you, you don't want to have the town manager sign it and then have it hang out there in that's perpetuity, that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, I suppose you could possibly amend this resolution to put an end date on it. Um, I would like to. I mean, I don't want this sitting out there six months and then all of a sudden we're negotiating a new deal and, you know. So that would fit, I think, if you have the resol resolution before you, if you add it at the end uh, under the now therefore be it resolved, uh, authorizing the town manager, uh, jump to the end, in the name and on behalf of the town of Enfield, comma, effective today until 30 days from now or whatever you deem to be the, the that target reasonable? you want to put on it. I would, the language that um, our attorney, ta attorney Talbert just used, I'd like to add as an Motion amendment. Add. 30, I, I'm, That's what we do in real estate. I know, I think, I don't, I don't want to sit out there and then. Use the same language we do in real estate. The, well, I think you have to do it for the purpose right. of this, this motion. So I think you can just read it again. Whatever day. Right. So it was uh, after uh, town of Enfield, comma, effective today until. 5 o'clock, whatever date. Right. Yeah, 5 p.m. Uh, March 3. What's our next council meeting? Oh. March, do it, the first council meeting in May, whatever we give them an extra couple days, whatever that is, March, March 5th, March 2nd. Well, I'd have one of you just frame it as a, an amendment or something. Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. All right. we're, we're, anyone? Let me just see when. Uh, I'll, I'll add it in a second, sorry. It's the second. Uh, that gives them, well, it's not 29 days. We'll do March 3rd, I guess. We'll give them the Monday after. All right. <laughs> so I would like to add an amendment after the town of Enfield in the last paragraph um, where it says it's a currently a, a, it's a period. I want to add a comma in the name of half of the town of Enfield, and I'll add until um, uh, effective today. Here's the line effective today. February 3rd until March 3rd at 5 p.m. 2020. 2020. All right, so that's good. I mean, I guess there's, I mean, it's not technically 30 days, I guess, when, I mean, right? Doesn't have to. All right, yeah. It is leap year. It's 29 days. All right, so let's be. I want to be. I want to be. I want to be good on this. Okay. I mean, I, I, before you second my, I re, re reword my amendment. Let me, again, I'm, until I'm effective. Back my second. <laughs> effective today, March uh, February third, two thousand twenty, until five p.m. March fourth, two thousand twenty. There you go. Second. There's a second amendment made. Second by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Any questions or concerns on the amendment, specifically the amendment? I, I, we need to protect ourselves. This cannot sit out there. Right. And I think we have every right to, to, since we've been working on this agreement for a while, to move this forward. And I'll just say publicly yeah. for our friends at home and for our friends here and in Florida, we will not entertain any other amendments or uh, changes. So right. just so they know, we've worked at this hard. They've agreed to what we have. We sent it to them. And uh, we would be very, very reticent and hesitant. And I, I dare say, uh, without seeing what they would propose, we wouldn't be entertaining any changes. So this is sort of a, I'm not being fresh. It's take it or leave it. Yep, I agree. Fair, fair analysis. 
So any amendment, any further discussion, questions, comments? On the amendment alone, all those in favor by show of hands. Opposed abstentions, we have nine in favor, zero in, f in favor of the amendment. Now the main motion has just amended. Is there any further question, comment, or discussion? John, anything further since you're there? I have nothing else to add. Okay. Hearing none, main motion as just amended. Roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Miller. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Barraza. Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Hemler. Four. Councillor Kiner. That's eight in favor, none against, no abstentions. Okay, moving on to item, zero, uh, item O, discuss from resolution. Resolution to authorize the waiving of a portion of the property maintenance fee fines at 34 Wheeler Drive. Whereas on November 25th, 2014, Beverly Kidder, the owner of 34 Wheeler Drive, also known as the property owner, was cited for violations of the property maintenance ordinance and was fined accordingly. Whereas pursuant to section 14-1A of the Enfield Town Code, the property owner contested their liability for the violations before a duly appointed hearing and the uh, a duly appointed hearing officer, and whereas the hearing officer found the property owner liable for two of the three violations, ruling in favor of the town. Whereas the hearing officer notified the property owner in writing of such decision. And whereas pursuant to section 14-183 of the Enfield Town Code, property maintenance liens securing the fines were recorded in the town land records. Whereas the property owner has approached the Blight Review Committee with a request to waive the fines and order the finance the construction of the home on the existing and on the existing foundation. And whereas the property has been bright, blight free since February 2016, whereas the Blight Review Committee has reviewed the request and are recommending the lien of the property be reduced by 75%. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Enfield Town Council does here, authorize the waiver of the portion of the property maintenance liens on 34 Wheeler Drive and authorizes that the amount set forth in attachment A be accepted in lieu of the full payment of those liens. Submitted on January 24, 2020 by the Town Manager's Office. So moved. Councilor Muller. Second. Seconded by Councilor Riley. Any discussion? I don't know anyone from Councilor... Um, Councillor uh, Councillor uh, oh, yep, uh, Kiner and I are on the blight board and uh, I think we agree that the um, the resident has uh, has remedied the situation and um, I'm just encouraging everybody to vote for this okay. well, Councillor Kiner I think because you're on the board any other comments or no okay Councillor Bosco well it worked I personally think it's too much but you know what? The Blight Board went at it. They worked hard. And uh, I'm not going to be the, 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 the nay vote on this, but uh, I, I just, you know, we just got to remember when we do some of these, people could have fixed the problem a long time ago. So, you know, the amount that we uh, cut on it, you know, it could have been fixed well before or something could have been done before it got as crazy as it did. But Blight Board did their job. They came with their recommendation. I'm going to support it. So uh, that's it. Councilor Kiner. Yeah, you know, I would say there is certainly precedent for this prior to the advent of the, uh, of the Blight Review Committee. Uh, the town council took it upon themselves to make this determination. And as far as we've learned, I guess there were four or five properties that had come before the town council over a period of years. And three, I think, of those um, uh, of liens were either removed or were substantially reduced. So there's certainly precedent for doing this. And uh, as uh, Councillor Hemler said, uh, we have a committee of five people. We worked very hard uh, to come up with what we believed was very objective criteria uh, to make this determination, and I, I'm satisfied with what we've come up with. Thank you, Sir, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Again, I just want to. I agree. We talked about this for a number of years, and and I say it all the time. I, government needs to reward good behavior, and I don't disagree. Maybe there's some things in the past that could have been worked out. However, the whole point of what we did a year and a half ago was get the, the give an appeals process to people to bring their property back up to compliance which is what, again, I know the committee's worked on. And I, and I agree maybe it would be nice to reduce it a little bit, but 
The committee's making a recommendation. I'm going to support it. And again, this is really what we're trying to achieve, reward good behavior, because if you live in those neighborhoods where one of your neighbors isn't doing what they're supposed to do in their property, it brings down the entire neighborhood. And as the point is to get it compliant and get everyone, again, doing what we all should be doing as good neighbors. So I agree with uh, Councillor Kiner, Councillor Bosco, and Councillor Hammer. I'll support it. Councillor Bosco. I can see this one, and I'm going to tell you, and the reason why I can see it is these people didn't have an opportunity to be able to do this. But there's going to be a few of these parcels that we're going to be having probably in the next, you know, six months or so to bring them up. After that point there, then maybe you got to start looking because things should never get this way. I mean, they had no choice. There was no other way before the blight board to be able to ask really for relief. So this is a good thing. I, mean, I, I don't mean it in a bad way, but uh, going forward, as, as things start going and these people really need to get these, these um, things in as quick as possible, because you know we just have some people that just don't want to do it. So when it gets time to sell the house or get a mortgage or do something, then they're going to come for our, you know, for a, a discount on it. So, uh, you know, I, I think that you know the, they have an avenue now. They should get everyone that has one that's willing to pay the fine, get it taken care of. Because I think as time goes by, the amount should be getting less and less and less. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Also, if you're served with a blight, um, I, forget, I don't know what they're called, but when you correct that blight infraction, you need to call and have somebody come out and look at the property. Because a lot of these have run up, and Kelly and Bill will, will testify to this, that you know people get one for not mowing their lawn. They mow their lawn, but they neglect to have the blight officer come back out there. So the clock keeps ticking. And it ticks all winter. So it's like we have to kind of be proactive about what we do. So if you get a blight citation and you clean it up, have the blight officer come out, start the clock, because you can ask for forgiveness when you've been cleaned up for, is it a year? A year, but you can only get it once. It's a year, but you can only get one. And it doesn't matter if it's a different blight infraction. That property now, with you and that property, you're done. So everybody make their house pretty. <laughs> No, I was just going to say this is exactly what you envisioned, Mr. Bosco, but because before uh, Councillor Kiner's point is well taken, we did it sort of hit or miss. We'd only do it when they were going to sell the property or there was a rush. Then we were asking Council to make these decisions. We didn't have somebody in place to make recommendations. We're kind of saying, well, it sounds like a good idea, but we were rushed to do it and they were uh, up against a mortgage contingency or a losing a sale. This is a much more orderly, calm process, which ends up then being fairer. And also, we believe, too, you shouldn't only be the person that is then selling the house who came into compliance to get the benefit of the reduction. So you're staying in the house. We had no other mechanism once the appeal period had gone, if they didn't avail themselves of it and to appeal it up through into the court, they were stuck with these on their property forever. So this is fair to those. You gave them that they have to be in compliance for at least a year before they come before you. So I think it's a much more uh, um, orderly, fair way to go about it. So I, I think you did a good job. And this is a result of that hard work. I think it worked. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Her none roll call, please. Mayor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Mangini? Four. Councillor Miller? Four. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Sferraza? Four. Deputy Mayor Zuzak? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Handler? Four. Councillor Kiner? Four. That's eight in favor, none against, no abstentions. All right, moving on to item, sorry. Communication. Item 16, public communications. We'll have, does anyone wish to speak for the council at this time? Mr. Young? George Young, 8 Holly Lane. Um, thank you, Mr. Bosco, for offering me to meet with the town manager a week ahead of time. But the truth is, um, I just finished my chart in my speech 
at home today, this afternoon, so that would be very difficult for me most, most occasions, but thank you anyway. The second thing, Chris, uh, I love the combining of jobs that the, the previous uh, people spoke about. And I know that uh, Deborah will always do and always has done a great job, so that's a great, great deal, great deal of work that you've done there. The next thing I'd like to say, at the bottom of page one and the top of page two uh, for 12A3, is it the term expiring on my page, correct, December 1, 2019, or has that changed? You can look at that and change it if you want, but if you look at the top of page three, it expires December 1 of 2019. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to look at that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, this, Last thing I want to mention, in the, in the special meeting of January 25th, uh, I agree with Mr. Sparaza. Uh, there should be a schedule when things are going to expire, uh, especially funds that have been allocated for projects. I asked this several months ago, and I thought it should be done in November, so you would have a chance to look at it, and when a project is going to be expired, you won't be stuck in May and June with the funds already getting go uh, being eliminated because you didn't use them. So, thanks. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Young. Appreciate it. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Bob. You're on. Bob T. Katz, Woodgate Circle. Carl, in all respect, you never go to the police station and complain about a police officer. It's never done. You don't win. The complainant always loses. I'll give you an example. Up in Nathan Bills up in Springfield, I think it was 17 police officers, 14 police officers. They did four guys in. The city of Springfield paid them off, but as they go to court, the prosecutor is dropping charges on the police officers. They lied in their reports. The owners lied in their reports. But nothing's going to happen to them. So you don't never complain about anything a police officer does. We got this so-called five-year project on Enfield Street. I don't know when that's going to end. But as far as I'm concerned, police officers should not be doing double duty on construction. They should hire private contractors. I served on the Board of Education back in the 90s, and we always complained about unfunded mandates. Well, you know what the state told us? I, apparently, you don't want any money. You get 40, 40 to 60 percent of the money, yet you say there's unfunded mandates. There's no such thing. Adult daycare center, that's a thing of the past. That should be end today. The whole Medicare is changing the way they're doing things. They want people in their homes. The nurses come to the house. Couriers deliver the medications. That's the future. They want to get rid of nursing homes. And I don't want to even go to a, to a senior center. I don't want to catch the virus. You go over to Suffield, half the time that place is shut down because there's too much disease going around in the air, especially now. Now, I talked about a couple studies in education. There are more studies. I have not found one study that shows infield education is on a positive upturn. It's about time the town council started putting their feet to the fire to the Board of Education to what changes have to be made to improve education in Enfield. Everybody says we have a great system, but the future it looks glum. Now. Let's talk about Enfield, <clears throat> Shelton. Every, everything that Chris said 30 seconds. about Enfield, the police department, the services they offer, well, Shelton offers that and even more. There's five paragraphs of, oh, they have a traffic division, they have detectives, they have uh, uh, accident investigation, they have everything that Enfield has. And yet, yet, Enfield's crime our property crime is about the state average, which is about 1,600, 1,700. And, and their property crime 
is <clears throat> about 60 percent of the state average. But you look at Shelton. I'll come back a yeah, second. No time. I'll come back a second time. Yeah. You look at Shelton's crime. It's half of Enfield, and they only have 55 police officers. But yet they do all the duties that Enfield does. We need to have a civilians to look at what the services provide in the police department. Because I ask the police chief several questions and I get no answers. Oh, Bob, you want to speak? That's not fair. You want to speak? Anyone else want to speak? Bob, you can, Bob, go ahead. You want three more minutes? No, I'm all right. Sure? I don't want you to get up. Anyone else that wish to speak? Declare public communications closed. Any counselor communications? Councilor Straza. I would, I would just say that I would, when I spoke before, I was not speaking on behalf of every police department all over the country. Police departments that have integrity and want to do the right thing, something does happen to the officers. And if you just go back and archive my tenure there, we arrested officers, we suspended officers who were wrong, because I tell you, who doesn't want bad cops? Other cops. So I encourage people, if they feel there's something wrong, they need to report it. And number two, um, there's an agreement between the police union and the town as far as private duty jobs that uh, I think the officers are very fair. One of the issues with private security is they don't have any jurisdiction on state roads to direct traffic. So they've agreed that if it's a small street, they'll let them do it. But any major throughways, you need a police officer, and that's just statutorily the case. So thank you. Councilor Riley. Um, I just wanted to defend the school system. Um, I think we do have a really good school system here. It may not be the best, but we are improving, and we are constantly trying to improve on that. When we find a problem, we come up with a solution, and we implement it, and then we get results, which is evidenced by the math results that we got. Curriculum noticed the problem, we implemented the plan, and within a year, we had positive results. So that's a positive thing. Everything might not be, you know, peaches and cream, but we are working consistently to move ahead and move forward and make our school system better than it is now, every day, keeping moving forward. Thanks. Councilor Bosco. Bob, I, I, I don't know. I've never been to Shelton. I don't know what Shelton looks like. Um, I don't know what their social economic is, but I think to say, be sort of safe to say that if you have 50% of the crime and you have a third less police officers, you're actually doing worse than us because, you know, the amount of crime and the amount of work that we have to do would probably justify the extra, I just don't know what kind of makeup they have down there, but if they got a lot less crime, you need a lot less cops. So, thank you. Stop Anyone else? The negative. Anyone else? Stop. I have a motion to adjourn. By Councilman Mangini. Second by all those in favor. There we go. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Have a good